And, uh, by the way, I'm sorry to drop your calls. You'll understand right now. Hello, is this John? It is. Michael, I am sorry that we had dyslexia of our time zone. Here. Oh, my goodness, John. I was worried there. Well, I'm beginning to worry myself. John, I don't even have the words. Well, John, that how was. Mer- how about Merry Christmas? John, th- those were words that you said that I have put on my intro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, John, actually, I was doing the show and having some fun with the callers, having a great time. So I think I might have to let you go, John. Well, that's okay, but just uh, holler back at me. I'm kidding, when, John. You know when, I'm playing. No, no, it's all right. If you Look, if you're having fun, you're having fun. I'm not going to stand between a man and having fun. Right? Oh, John, give me a break. You know I love you. <laughs> so welcome back to the program. The last time I talked to you, John, was under a different banner, but now... Things are are right where they need to be, and matter of fact, there's been times where I have been wanting to call your personal cell phone number for advice, but John, I have to admit, you're the only person I've ever been intimidated by. Well, there's no reason to be intimidated by me. I'm on your side. No, exactly, but you know, I always thought, I don't want to bother him, but there was one big pressing issue I had in regards of advice. Well, there was a couple, but... One of those really played themselves out for for all of us to see. And now what you're listening to now is the new rendition of the old. And now I'm doing a show alone. Well, all I can say is congratulations. Well, thank you very much. It, um, you know, when I interviewed you the last time, that was a real game changer for me. I've got so many different emails from subscribers who have never heard of the show before and they were saying things like, you and John need your own show. And I thought, Jesus Christ, what a compliment. <laughs> well, I owe it all to him anyway, so why not? Oh, yes. Good times, good times. So, John, let's let's start back to basics here. Let's start from, from scratch. Can you tell all the listeners out there who might not even know who you are, can you give them a little summary about yourself here? Well, I was, uh, I'm the guy who was, uh, the voice, but no name to go with it for mm, about two and a half decades doing voiceovers for everything from arena shows in Amsterdam for the great, uh, sensation. Uh, IDNT produces that one. In fact, they're going to do the, uh, they're going to do another one, uh, in the summer of 2017. And I've been with them on uh, every show except for the very first one. In 1999, I believe I started with them in 2000 and, uh, many other, many other, uh, uh, national commercials and traveling museum exhibits and instructions in manufacturers trucks to tell the operators how to operate things and military industrial complex stuff. I, uh, I don't feel really good. I, I, at first I felt good about getting a patch for my flight jacket for the F 35, but yeah. Then, there were all those cost overruns, and I really kind of wish I had the patch for the Raptor instead because I worked on that project also. But uh, just, uh, I mean, I wasn't telling them what color to paint the planes or anything. I was just, uh, you know, reading the specifications and the performance uh, data for uh, the Department of Defense and, and a lot of stuff that went to the Department of Energy back when the superconducting super collider, when they were trying to build a little CERN, a little version of CERN, down here just about 20 miles south of uh, where I am now in Dallas. And, uh, then gradually, um, I became wondering, a, a wondering guy. And I was thinking, gee, back in the old days, I needed an engineer and I needed a secretary and I needed an agent and, and, uh, managers in those days were almost, uh, really almost unheard of for people in voiceover work because now I could do all of this, manage everything from a laptop computer and even take it on the road to continue doing voiceovers if I had to go out of town or go out of the country. And uh, not being able to work with a crew was really, um, you know, just was a little bit too much of the solitary guy. So I went to and spoke with a, a man at uh, Premier Radio Networks, and the next thing I knew, I was doing a slot on Coast to Coast, but that was 05. Right. And that was the only show I did. So uh, 06 went by and 07 went by, and I did uh, either one or two shows. I remember one in particular, which was uh, a conversation with uh, the late, great Ray Bradbury, the great science fiction writer and visionary. In 08, and then nothing happened in 09. A few shows in 2010, but several shows in 2011, and then they put me in the Saturday night position 
in uh, 2012, the, uh, the first Saturday for January. Right. And John, and, let me uh, cut you off there and just say congratulations, by the way. I understand you're getting married, right? Yes, I, I certainly am. It's, uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be an honest man in the not too distant future. I love that. Yeah. So anyway, long story short, I was at coast to coast for, for two years. And, um, when they said, okay, well, we're going to go a different direction because I was more interested in things like, Oh, global communism and what a failure this president has been. And, um, and I tried to keep it gentlemanly and somewhat subtle, but it wasn't subtle enough. Do you think but that's, anyway, do you think that's exactly the reason why the walls closed in on you there, John? Your criticism over Obama? No, I think that probably was part of it. But the other part, I think, was, was, uh, there were very high ratings for Saturday night. Did there was what? Find, what? I'm very, well, there were, so, there were so many listeners on Saturday night that it, uh, according to all the data that I got after I left the program, the, uh, the listeners numbered far higher on Saturday night than they did the rest of the week combined. This probably made certain people uncomfortable. And so it was just natural that they should send me down the road, which of course I'm delighted about two things. Um, the two best things that happened were going to, to work for Coast to Coast AM. And the second great thing that happened was being released from Coast to Coast AM so that I could do my own program, which is called Caravan to Midnight. Correct. It can be, uh, it can be found at caravan to midnight.com. And we're, um, here in a couple of months. We're going to enter our fourth year. Yeah. So um, it's you just never really know where your fate lies. Yeah. It's just uh, it's astonishing. Yeah. And you were you pulled in 1.2 million listeners on that's Saturday what, night. That's, that's what they say. That is pretty wild, John. I thought so. Did you ever believe that would ever happen? Well, interestingly, I would hear all these numbers that oh, we've got 16 million listeners uh, a week, and I thought, wow, that's kind of a stretch. And then I heard eight and then I heard three and then I heard that Mr. Bell had pulled three million a night and I heard all of this stuff and I was talking with Mr. Ghost and, um, that's my son, by the way. Right. And, um, and he said, how many people do you think are in the audience? I said, well, nobody will tell me what the numbers are over there, but, um, you know, they're saying eight million and three million and all, all kinds of millions. I said, I'd be surprised if there were a million people listening. He said, did you hear the words that just came out of your mouth? <laughs> well, you know, a million people is quite a, quite a, a good number. Sure. But, uh, yeah, I think probably everybody exaggerates a little bit, you know, no matter who it is. Uh, you know, somebody who's paid $10 million to do a movie, by the time the, uh, the agent, the manager, the lawyer, the publicist, and the taxes are paid, that $10 million shrinks down to about, I don't know, 2.7, 2.8, maybe as high as 3.1, but, but, uh, but it sounds better if you say, $10 million per picture. Conversely, uh, I won't buy it for 20 bucks, but 1999 sounds really good. So it's just, it's the trick of the numbers. You know, it's the perception yeah. of the numbers. But anyway, I was delighted to find out that there were, there were that many listeners because, you know, it just meant that some people out there found value in what I was doing in that chair. And, and that's good. I mean, that you can't, you cannot buy this. You, you have to do the work. And then if people like the work, then they'll let you know. And doing a show like Coast to Coast AM, were you always interested in the fringe side of these topics? Yes, until we reached a point where most of the fringe topics of the day had been discussed. You know, a lot of people still want it to be 1995. Correct. But, but 1995 is 21 years ago. And Long gone. And many of these things, you know, like remote viewing and and uh, extraterrestrial this and uh, government conspiracy that. Back then, they were still in the realm of, wow, what if? Well, now we know that these things are real. So let's move on and find out. Let's, let's, let's talk about some other things that are in the realm of what if that, that have not been confirmed. But a lot of people want to stick with the old paradigm and, and that paradigm is gone. It's shifted into something else now. I'm also glad you continue to keep pushing forward through the thick and thin after Coast to Coast AM. And, you know, the last time I talked to you, you were doing Caravan to Midnight, and it was just, uh, I think it was just streaming on, online, correct? And you weren't doing any kind of nighttime radio. That's correct. That's correct. It's a, it's a recorded program that, uh, that we, we post the programs at uh, 10 o'clock uh, every night, Central Time, and unless we have uh, 
you know, every once in a while we'll have an issue. Like we, we've had to put some other servers in the chain, locate them in different places around the world. Uh, and some of the places where they're located, they don't respond to any demands from, uh, shall we say, the imperial authorities here yes. in this country. And that way we can um, ensure a, a continuous flow of information without any uh, uh, imperial entanglements, as Obi-Wan Kenobi once said. Right. And yeah. I believe you are on KLIF 570 AM. That's it. We're going to do a Christmas Eve show tomorrow night. We just have two hours on there because that's all that was available. I understand but, that um, there's a chat room there. Um, I believe the last time I talked to you, you were very against that sort of thing. What happened? Well, here's the thing. Um, as you know, there are there is a small cadre of of people out there. Some of them are paid trolls. The trolls, some, yes. Yeah, and some of them are just angry people, and they're frustrated about something, or you know, most of the time they're in agony about something. They 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 have enough self respect and pride that they're not going to admit this, and I understand that, and I'm okay with it. But you, you've heard the uh, the expression they they type with their middle fingers. I, of course, yeah. Yeah, they're just they're mad about all kinds of things, and they don't. And this is the only way that they can express their their angst and their anger at the things that are happening to them that they feel they don't have any control over. And I don't blame them for that. I was I was among them. I've just redirected that energy because when you get angry, if you allow that anger to be directed inward to yourself, this becomes depression. But oh, if you yeah. turn that anger outward and you control it in a judicious manner, it turns into, it becomes productivity and you cannot give up. You, you simply cannot give up no matter what your circumstances are. If, if you are interested in, in remaining alive, which pretty much everybody is, unless they've, they've just departed reality. And there are some people like that too. And uh, when they can be helped, then we will help them. But you can only help people who are willing to be helped. Correct. You know, you sometimes we want a, a better life for others than they want for themselves. So That's you, true. So you run into that every once in a while. Yeah, you could only but, lead a horse to the water, but it's the horse who must drink the water. Yeah, you know, and I had the idea that, look, I don't want um, I don't want people to be able to just get on there and start calling each other names and threatening each other and getting crazy. I said, just take this forum down because if, if people can be classified uh, officially – and by themselves as adults, then I expect them to behave that way and they can engage True. Uh, at, at a high level of tension. But when it goes into profanity and, and threats and then you get a, a couple of phonies in there saying stuff like, Marianne is dead. She was brutalized in the forum. John B., you should have helped her. And then sure as hell, you find out there was no Marianne. Hmm. He was a guy and it, and he works with somebody that is a woman and they – do this kind of stuff all the time. I just thought, you know what? We're not, we're not going to provide a forum for idiots to inflict themselves on other people who did not come into this forum to have anything inflicted upon them. So we just took that thing down. Now what we do is, is, um, we do have a chat room on, on Facebook, but, uh, it's, that's, it's, what do you call it? It's moderated. Yeah. You keep it tame. Well, yeah. You know, you, you just, you can, you can, you can have a party. But you can't invite somebody. If, if you invite a guest to the party that starts, you know, this guest be begins uh, putting feet on the couch and putting cigarettes out in the plants right. and the dog and, you know, throwing champagne or whatever at the cat and being ugly and cussing people out and starting fights. Well, you have to eject these people from the party because uh, what's the old expression? That's just not cool. It, that's true. <laughs> it's not cool. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's why we do it. Yeah, and John, I, I know very well. There's there's quite a number of idiots who follow me around now as well. Number of trolls. Well, idiots and trolls need love too. You have to you have to question their motives. But um, the thing is, you can hate the act, but just don't hate the uh, don't hate the actor. You know, you can hate the sin, but you don't have to hate the sinner, and you shouldn't. That's very you know? very true. And John, going back to Coast to Coast AM and Art Bell, I. I was curious to know about this. I had heard you were asked about hosting Art Bell's uh, show, Midnight in the Desert, when he returned or when he first left. Is that a fact? You know, there was some sort of a little rumble about that, but it never really got any traction because I had already started. Uh, I was going to do something during the day because uh, 
as I say, you, not having to, to actually physically go from studio to studio and just being able to do it over the internet. That's a lot better. That's a lot better and yeah. it frees up a lot of time and before long you go, well, wait a minute. You, my days are going by here. I think I'd like to do something a little bit more meaningful than waiting for the next session. So why don't we do something during the day? But, um, I think coast to coast may have perceived that to be a, 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 a threat of some sort. They didn't really, but, but, you know, maybe not. Maybe it was just the numbers and nothing more because, um, most of the guests that come on are the guest hosts. Um, Ian Punnett, who was on there, he did a morning show. I understand at Minneapolis, St. Paul, another guy, uh, Dave uh, Schrader, he's got his own program and, and, um, and even, um, George Knapp. You know, he's a Las Vegas TV reporter and a investigative journalist guy. So they've all got their own shows. So I think that was just a, I think that was just a lame excuse. And then it got even lamer because it was almost like, oh, wait a minute. Uh, why'd you fire Wells? Well, we didn't fire him. He quit. It's like, well, what do you mean he quit? Well, no, we did fire him. Well, no, we can't say he fired him because he was never, he never really was an employee. Oh no. What? Yeah, going. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> they just couldn't figure out what, what line they wanted to go with, you know, bless them. And, and before long, it's like, yeah, let me tell you what I did. With the help of the Zionists and the CIA, I hijacked their apparatus. And when I went on the air on Saturday night, there was nothing they could do about it. You see? Right. I even had some help from Bigfoot. He picked me up in the UFO every once in a while. Oh my goodness. To, uh, Zionist CIA headquarters over in the basement at CERN and figure out how we were going to screw over coast to coast. And then I, then I go back on the air after hacking into their apparatus. So, <laughs> well, I'm glad, I'm glad they, um, they sent you back to earth from the spaceship. Yeah, me too. The motherboard. Yeah. The motherboard. There is no mothership. You're, you're exactly right. Now you've done it. Mm-hmm. You've revealed the truth. I, I might have slipped up there. It's the motherboard. It is. <laughs> it really, it truly is. But it was a fantastic time. I wouldn't have missed it. It was a, it was I know a you, great experience. It seemed like you were, have, you were having a great time. But even now, today, I'm sure there, there's always those moments of clarity for you now. You know, I, I hope so. Because there are two ways to do things. It's almost like... Um, you can wad up a piece of paper on your desk there and aim real carefully at the trash can in the corner. And the more carefully you aim, the more surely you will miss. But if you just grab the paper and um, just make it an act, not a contrivance, just don't plan, just do, then usually the ball of paper will go right in the trash can. You just you know that you want the paper ball to go in the trash can. You know where it is. Right. Your brain knows where it is, even though you're not looking at it. And you just wad it up and you just toss it and it goes right in. But if you plan and plan and plan and plan, you get nine times out of ten you miss. And, you, and why is that? It's because you're overthinking it. And so these moments of clarity, I can only, I can only hope that I have them because, you know, like, like Bob Dylan said, hey, I'm just me. You know, right. thing. I thought, wow, Bob, that's kind of a broad generalization about yourself, but okay. Well, I'm glad um, you're, you're honest about that though. Yeah, you, you just do what you do, and then you, when it's over with, then you know how good or bad it was. I'm not saying you don't watch what you're doing while you're doing it, but if you if you if you practice to contrive, your initiative will fail. So realizing that, I would say is probably my my most important uh, moment of, of clarity. Is just, and this came some years ago. Just you know, because you know, Lisa Lyon, she was a uh, Lisa Lyon, executive producer over there. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. And she's a real sweetheart. She, uh, I mean, I don't mind saying this at all. She, she trained me how to be a proper talk radio show host. And she kept saying, you know, look, you know, you're just, just, just let that cat out of the cage. And I said, Lisa, I'm really not sure you want me to do that. <laughs> and she said, no, absolutely I am. So I did. And, uh, the, the audience seemed to find value in it. And it made management uncomfortable. <laughs> I, that's right. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm as I'm as happy as a as a hog in a mud hole because uh, now I'm doing my own thing and I don't have to worry about it too much. Exactly. You were getting quite a bit of heat from the upper brass right there. But hey, that that happens when you're uh, red hot or white hot rather. Well, you know, it's uh, maybe there's a, I can't really explain it. <clears throat> I would like to have a moment of clarity about about uh, that, but you have to ask yourself, okay, do I give it my best or do I just give it 
half of what I think I'm capable of and appease the ones who are in authority. Um, but if you're not going to tell me, you, you can't play that record because if you do, it's going to play in the wrong day part and the concert company that was going to give us the concert to sponsor is not going to do it now because you, you played that record. If they're not going to tell you the way the game is played, then they're the ones who are responsible when it doesn't get played the way that they want it to be. Very true. I agree. And so basically it's believe them if they can't take a joke. Okay. Exactly. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> now, John, you know, going back to the radio industry and all of what it really is, going back to an actual studio, how much has things changed for you? Uh, in, in what way? So I can dial it in a little closer. Otherwise, my answer is going to be all over the place. Well, I was hoping for an all over the place answer, but just in terms of how things are, are set and conducted, um, way back then, of course, we had the, the reel to reel audio tape recorder. Uh, of course, the Beatles and the Beach Boys are, are kind of the ones who kind of made that famous back in the 1960s. Mm. Well, in terms of technology, well, oof, I can tell you this, in my opinion, it's, it's nowhere near as much as much fun when I would um, until I got uh, a studio set up that was suitable for for um, broadcast, just configuring the equipment so that um, acquiring the equipment and then configuring the room to, you know, to be a proper room. You know, nowadays, it's uh, so much easier to do this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It is. But you, I would go you do this the, in a closet. Yeah, you can. And in fact, on the road, sometimes I have done that, but, um. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's fine. Whatever it takes. I, uh, yeah, I agree. Get the job done. But you know, we, uh, I started off the, the, what I would call the major league radio at, uh, KZUW FM 98 FM in Dallas. And you had, uh, morning show guys. A team would come on from six to ten and, one person would do it from 10 to 2, and one person would do it from 2 to 6, and then somebody from 6 to 10, and then a 10 to 2 at night, and then a 2 to 6 in the morning. So you had, you had all these jocks, and they had their, their individual styles that they could, uh, that they could, um, have, and it was compatible. Nobody was telling them to be somebody that they weren't, or, or speak in a certain way or anything. You know, they had their personalities, those, perf those personalities were, were, um, they fit properly into the overall sound of the station. But now what you have, you have a lot of voice tracking. Um, you don't select your own records anymore. Matter of fact, after I left uh, uh, the zoo in Dallas, after I started off at the 10 to 2 at night, and then when I got a regular shift there, before that it was like 2 to 7 a.m. Saturday morning for about two months, and then um, they put me on 10 to 2 at night. And then I went into the afternoon drive from two to six and, uh, and got a record share there too, as well. 23.8 share of men 18 to 49 in the afternoon on a rock station. You must have it been, just made people nuts. You, you must know? have had a great time, by the way. I did. I had a fabulous time, but about two weeks after I left, uh, the jocks didn't get to pick their own music anymore. They were presented with a, you know, a, a printed out sheet of songs that they were, they were, uh, instructed to play. And that's what they did. Sounds like and the so, fun kind of went away uh, there. I get in. Well, I get in on the beginning of everything too. Cause, um, after that, shifting from, from rock radio and I just went immediately into voiceover because by that time <laughs> I'd done two or three spots out there that were national spots. Oh, nice. And, and uh, a lot of the people that worked in the ad listened to us in the afternoon and said, why don't we get that guy? Yeah, so by the time uh, the zoo was ready to let me go, um, I was to to take voiceover the voiceover business to um uh, take that. And by the time it was all over with, I was on every continent with the exception of uh of uh a Chinese mainland. Yeah. In Arctic work in uh exactly and it's um I told people a long time ago it's gonna be more before you know it. What happens? You know, think about this. The ringtone business and this is this is fifteen years ago, easily. So the ringtone business for so Uh oh, I'm losing you there, John. It seems like the internet is hating us right now. Yeah, you're is it getting weird? Yeah, just a little bit. Let's see. Got a little funky there. Alright, how about this? That's getting better, yeah. Alright. That's way better now, yeah. 
Now I can hear you. Sorry about that. The, you know, the, the real, you know, the money was three, $3.6 billion just in ringtones. Jeez, really? And I told people, oh, yeah, man, it was unbelievable. These I didn't know that. We're making these goofy little ringtones and selling them, and people Holy. were buying them by the countless millions. And Wow. And I said, the next thing you're going to see is is apps. That's where the real money is. You develop an app that people want, and you're going to be set for life pretty soon. Well, that happened, too. And the next thing I told them was, next thing you're going to see are apps in the car. And you have that. You can go and buy a new Toyota if you want to and turn on the radio, and you'll see Pandora and iHeart and a bunch of them already loaded in there. So, By the way, uh, John, would you say the voiceover business is more difficult to get into than, I guess you could say, the radio talk show business? Yeah, I would. And I'll tell you why. The margins are too low because there's too many people doing it. There's got to be uh, way too many people doing it. Yeah, and back in 2000, which is a, a long time ago now, right? It, it is, but it, it doesn't seem that long ago. I know it seems like about two months ago, but seriously, but, uh, after a pull a strike, and um, they're they're combined into one union now. After and SAG are one union. They used to be separate, but after after did this strike, and they wanted uh, increases and all this. I guess they thought the the uh, advertisers were just going to roll, roll over for it, but they didn't. What they did was they um, they started hiring non union workers, and the product continued to move. So they thought we don't need this. You know, we don't need this, this high dollar stuff anymore. And so that's what happened as long as they're, but what happened was actually the quality of everything got pulled down. It's much like people were, uh, for a while it was, oh, you know, vinyl records. That's old school. Uh, too many pops and clicks. We want CDs because CDs don't skip and they last forever and all that. Of course, that turned out to be total nonsense. What it was was digital was never meant to be good. It was meant to be good enough, but mostly it was meant to be cheap and fast. And that's, that's what they got. So now what, what are the, what is the audiophile medium of choice? Vinyl records and a high quality turntable and hopefully a tube amplifier. Tube you amp know? is always good. Yeah. That warm so, sound. It's like I always say, brother, if you want to, if you want a new idea, read a really old book. That's actually great advice. Uh, I mean, it really is just like, um, uh, the Russians, for example, they, uh, a lot of their stuff is EMP proof. Why? Because it's tube powered. Matter of fact, if you need a new set of Svetlanas or uh, some Teslas for your Marshall amplifier, you get the Svetlanas. I think the Teslas are made in Russia too. I may be wrong about that, but Russia is the biggest manufacturer, maybe even the only manufacturer of vacuum tubes in the world now. Now think about this. In 1937, I believe it was, a Scotsman <clears throat> named John, nicknamed Logie Baird, had a three-dimensional color television picture in a glass tube. Mm -hmm. Three-dimensional color in a glass tube in 1937. And what year is it? Here in about a week? 2017. Yeah. And we still don't have three-dimensional color television pictures <laughs> That's in, true. A, in, in an aquarium or in a giant glass tube or anything else. So this technology is just being recycled and recycled and the good stuff is being saved for later when they can roll it out as new and improved. It's all about, it's like driving your new car off the, off the, off the lot. The, the, uh, the crass salesman who just collected the commission on your, on your new car sale to you says, Hey, come see me next year because I'm telling you the new ones that are coming out are going to make that look like a real piece of junk. Okay. It's not that they don't have those new features deployable on the current year. It's just that they gotta, they gotta keep the new thing going. You know, if you don't have, uh, I mean, even back like in 79 and 78 and back then, you got a Trans Am. It's a nice Trans Am, right? But this one over here has electric door locks and electric windows and, oh uh, yeah, well, this one's kind of shabby because I've got manual door locks and, and window cranks. So yeah, mine's not as good. It's, it's kind of that syndrome. It's Until now, you know, I, frankly, I like going back to the old hot rods because I like it too. because it's enough. You got your ignition key, you got your wheel, your brake pedal, your clutch and your gas pedal. You got a gas gauge, a battery gauge, a water temperature gauge, a tack and a speedo. That's all you have. You don't have every function and you don't have all this sophisticated circuitry that um, clutters up your interior and just gives you a whole lots of stuff to do because now it's become so complicated and people are so damn distracted. That um, now maniacs like uh, Elon Musk 
wants to give you a self-driving car. Yeah. You can't manage all the systems. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it seems like those self-driving cars are, are getting into a number of accidents now. Well, they can eventually dial them in, but, um, you know, it's like if you want to get someplace in a hurry, you fly commercial. But if you want to fly, you take your own plane, even if it's just a little, little puddle jumper, you know, and you experience flying. The object of flying is flying when you have a private aircraft. But if you, if you want to get someplace in a hurry, you just, you just go get on a, um, just go get on a commercial airliner and, and go and you're there in, in two hours where in, in a Bonanza or 182 or something would take you hours and hours. But not everybody wants or needs to get there in two hours. And people don't need to be looking at their phones and sending text messages and, and everything else that they can do and playing with their various apps and all these devices on their cars because they're running into each other. So what's happened is that they provide you with all these conveniences. And yet somehow with every new convenience, your life becomes less convenient until now. It's like, wait, 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 wait. You're not really evolved. You're, you're not, you're not capable of, of, you just sit there and we'll let the car drive you. That's true. So we just paint ourselves into a corner with all these, these so-called conveniences or not conveniences at all. They're just, they're not meant to be good. They're meant to be bought. I'm not even sure if I feel comfortable doing that, letting a vehicle drive, drive me. I feel more at ease with myself controlling the wheel. Yeah, I mean, there was such a thing as, uh, you know, when I was a kid, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. Uh, when we finally got cars. No, I'm kidding. We took <laughs> pride in being able to drive them well. Um, we took pride in being able to. We'd go out on a frozen parking lot and, um, and s- spin the car around and slide and see what the car would do so that if this ever came up, uh, by way of an emergency, you know, an oil slick or somebody spilled some diesel fuel or there was some sand or there was some black ice or whatever, you know, your reflexes were already tuned to react pretty much instantly. I mean, we took, we took pride in being <clears throat> really good drivers. It doesn't, doesn't mean sitting there like a moron, <laughs> like a, ma- like a mannequin, you know, just sure. driving down the street at 29.9 miles an hour in a 30 zone. It, it just meant that we, we knew what the machine would do. And we also knew what it would not do. So we knew where the, we knew where the guardrails were, so to speak. And we stayed b- between those guardrails and didn't hit them. But now it's like, Oh, let us do that for you. Oh, no, no, no. I heard somebody say one time, anti-lock brakes, for example, they don't, it's not that they make you safer. It's that they enable you to break the law with a higher degree of safety. <laughs> I agree. No <laughs> doubt. I think that's true to some degree. <laughs> By the way, John, are, are you still smoking cigarettes? I'm smoking one right now. By the way, have you, I'm, I'm glad you're admitting that, um, have you ever tried one of those e-cigarettes? Have you seen how those things have been blowing up in pockets and faces for a while now? Well, I felt sorry for that, for that guy. When I Jesus. Saw him, I think it was last night. It looked like yeah. he blew his whole crotch off. He was in uh, Fresno, California. A bus driver, you can hear, telling him to not to vape on the bus. And then, of course, moments later, the poor guy... Is seen there with with um, his uh, cigarette going off in his pocket. No. That sucks. You know what can I say? Nobody's ever called me a quitter, but when the smartphones start catching fire and the e-cigarettes start blowing up, as my dad used to say, "Put my ration in the in the the can over there." <laughs> you know, I don't want any of that. Yeah, it's. Um, and I'm not sure those things are any safer for you. I don't think so either, to be honest with you. And technology is not proving to be that perfect either yet. Look, you smoke, maybe you get cancer, maybe you don't. You don't smoke, never smoked a cigarette in your life, maybe you get cancer, maybe you don't. I mean, people are smoking less now than probably, probably less now than, than in the last 50 something years. By the way, people in China smoke you know, nonstop and they never get cancer. I know, and they live forever. That's insane. On almost nothing. <clears throat> so what does that tell us? Now, I've been seeing this on, uh, I'm not seeing it so much lately because of two reasons. Number one, uh, I don't, I haven't tuned in that often. And number two, when I do tune in, I don't see them anymore. But mm-hmm. for a couple of months, maybe longer than that, it was two in three men will get cancer. One in three women will get cancer, not might get cancer or I have a problem, have a high probability of it. They will get cancer. Two in two out of three men and one out of three women will get cancer. Mm. And people are smoking less than ever before. 
So I wonder what you do in that. I wonder. Well, it's every, it's, it's everything else. Life causes it's, cancer. Uh, well, yeah, there are like 3,000 municipalities that have uh, lead content in their water that's higher than Flint, Michigan. That's not good. So, you know, that's that's where Caravan to Midnight started originally is when Fukushima melted down. I knew it was a meltdown. Right. I knew by the way that they couldn't get their story straight on the networks. Are you – are, John, Plus are you – Fox truck. Right. Are you eating seafood or are you done? That's that's it. You're never touching that again. Well, I'm just going to – they've detected uh, – They've detected radiation in, in uh, fish. They have released, you know, every time there's a release of information over some mainstream channel, you know, it's as if it just happened. Yeah. But people mm-hmm. have been detecting radioactivity in, in fish for a few years now. Correct. I mean, Fukushima, we're, we're moving into our sixth year. So, no, I'm, I'm done with that for now. Yeah. I don't, your best bet is yeah. your Chilean sea bass and stuff that comes from down around the Gulf. Yeah, I think I'm done with the seafood for now. It's sad, but uh, there's really – I can't imagine what they can do about that. It's a massive disaster. Truly. In fact, on Caravan, we published a letter from the doctor who went to the United States, and he was with some man at Lawrence. Well, I, can't, I, don't, I don't remember the doctor's name. The, the document may still be on the site for all I know, but I don't troll my own site. But um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should, John. But, but he went back – yeah, maybe I should. But, but <laughs> this funny. Japanese man, he's in his 90s now. And he sent the letter and uh, we put it on our site. And it was, he was effectively begging his government not to go through with this nuclear power thing, that it was an absolute nightmare just waiting to happen. And they didn't listen. And General Electric and others were, were uh, more than happy to hook them up with the, uh, with the nuclear reactors. And I mean, most people don't even know how they work, but all it is is, is you have these radioactive rods and you have them in what is effectively a thing that looks like a wine rack, only more high tech. And when you get them close to each other, they produce heat. So you flow water over that, over those things. And before long, it's boiling. And when you boil the water, then it converts to steam because it's boiling and it spins these steam turbines and generates your electricity. Right. Which is why Albert Einstein said, it's a hell of a way to boil water. And he's right. Mm hmm. Because that's all it is. The problem is, once they've been exposed to each other for a long time, they begin to decay. But the problem is, is when they decay, the, the, the potency of the rod doesn't decrease. The spent fuel rods are active, actually much more highly radioactive than a brand new fuel rod. So it, it makes one wonder, why would you put 54 nuclear power plants in a known earthquake and tsunami zone? Why would you do this? That and the answer is, is money. That's all. Yeah, that that's just an unfortunate disaster waiting to happen. And Japan's that's why been... It says in the Bible. That's why it says in the Bible, yeah. the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah. If they haven't destroyed Japan, then Japan is going to emerge as, as a very special people that somehow ionizing radiation made them stronger and robust, healthy people and uh, who can now walk into melting down reactor rooms and... <laughs> Right. All he needs is a little asbestos suit, which asbestos is one of the best things you could possibly breathe into your body, you know? Who knows? I feel bad for them, though. They're always dealing with a really bad earthquake every couple months now. It's it's terrible to see. You know, these may not be the end days, but they'll certainly do until the end days get here. There's a lot of uh, solar activity. We're supposed to get a huge, huge uh, blast of... uh, solar radiation on christmas day yeah it is almost like the end of days yeah you know but at the same time i spoke with uh with uh, a man from uh egypt he was actually in egypt on today's program oh okay um yusef awian and his father who lived well into his 80s was uh devoted his life to studying uh, the pyramids there and so does yusef is the son he carries on the work and as we were talking, I um, I asked him, because in the end, I said, why don't we just uh, get into it right now? Who put those things there and who built them? <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's get right to it. And, you know, he laughed because it's like, well, they not the answer everybody wants to know. But uh, the problem is you go through these ancient languages and, and the Sumerians and the hieroglyphs and just the plain glyphs. Um, and, I, and I asked him, because he's a student of these things, I asked him, has, has your research revealed a record of a cataclysmic event? And he said, yes. And it's this myth that was started a long time ago. 
and uh, apparently there was a uh, there was an event of some kind that uh, that was caused by the sun. I suspect it was an enormous. It just sounds like an enormous solar flare. And uh, and he said that it wiped out almost all of humanity. But this is a long time ago. Look, if if people cannot, if the smartest people in the business cannot make a forecast for a week that's really rock solid, reliable, then how can you trust them to just know that? Well, that star is five point five million light years away, or they know exactly what was happening ten thousand years ago. They know exactly. Well, it's happening two million years ago when the dinosaurs were around. They have no clue whatsoever when it comes right down to it as to, as to the age of this earth. They don't know. Carbon 14 dating is supposed to be such a big deal. Well, first they said, Oh, this is absolutely the stuff. And then they said, Well, a few years later, they said, Well, maybe not really because nitrogen escapes from different things at different rates. And I'm thinking to myself, Really? I'm listening to an expert say this. Well, duh. <laughs> of course it does. Yes. How uh, could it not? How I, could, how could nitrogen not escape at different rates from different materials? By the way, John, have you interviewed Michael Cremo? That, that name is certainly familiar to me. I may have. I, I'm thinking, I don't know. I'll check while we're talking. Yeah, we got into an, um, I had interviewed him and we got into a fascinating discussion about human origins. And um, this kind of reminds me of some of the things we were talking about and how the Smithsonian kind of, um, I guess you can say, they, they like to interfere a lot. In what way? Ah, well, anytime there's some sort of discovery that doesn't fit a certain narrative for them, they um, go and take that sort of thing away from uh, those who discovered it, like skeletons and other artifacts. See, I don't know you personally, but I, I suspect that you're an improvise, adapt, and overcome kind of guy. Whatever it is, you'll sort it out, and then you'll figure out how to proceed either with it or around it with and without it. And I think that uh, they, they sell the, uh, the maturity level of the, certainly the American population. I think they sell us a little short when they, when they just assume that we can't handle any of this. I agree. Ah, well, maybe that's not what the problem is. Maybe it's that they're afraid, I'm using the word afraid, that if certain information gets out, there are going to be a lot of really ticked off kids with some really, really high student loan debt that are going to be going back and asking for their school fees to be refunded that they've paid and that the student loan be be uh, zeroed out because what they were taught was absolute bollocks. Yeah. That's what they're afraid of. They They are continuing to teach. I'm finishing up on that carbon-14 uh, deal. The carbon-14 dating method was supposed to be just absolutely the best. Just a few years later, I'm talking like maybe three or four, they said, not really. And now they're going back to it again. And no, carbon-14 is, uh, dating is just fine. Well, is it or isn't it? You know, they could, they could look at tree rings and go, yeah, you know, a long time ago, like these great big giant trees, we got a lot of rings. They've been around a long time. But... They can look in there and they can see what was happening with the weather just by looking at the rings. But their data isn't factored into the other data from these other guys that are trying to promote an agenda. Exactly. You know, hmm. that seems like everyone. Warming thing. Of course, there's global yeah. warming, but but there's only one thing that causes weather on planet Earth. I mean, you get up to forty, fifty, sixty thousand feet, and you'll figure out how insignificant even a million people are. And by the way, the world, the Earth is not flat. Huh. But that, we'll talk about that some other time. Sure. And by the way, um, what's your opinion on Edward Snowden? Some say he's a hero and some say he's a villain. What do you think, John? He broke the law by, by leaking that stuff, but he did a huge service to his country by leaking that stuff. I don't think he's a villain. I think he's just a guy who, did, who made a decision. Now, people can say, well, you know, maybe it's CIA. Maybe it's NSA, CIA together. And they decided that they would let Edward Snowden be known as a guy who leaked this stuff so we can put this stuff right out in the open, right in front of people, and then they'll get used to the idea of continual surveillance, except for one thing, brother. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll make this assertion in, uh, or I'll, I'll submit this uh, for your consideration in question form. Mm -hmm. Do we believe that the NSA is a super secret organization? Do we believe that they have every landline call, mobile phone call, 
uh, recorded every email, every fax, everything. Do we believe it or do we not? According to his if movie, do, yeah. Then, oh, oh, just like, do they had, yeah. Do you think they had Hillary Clinton's emails? That well, they say the the Russians were involved. That's that's the hot topic. Yeah, well, we didn't see any votes flipping from uh, from uh, Trump to, to or from Hillary to Trump. True. We only saw them flipping from Trump to Hillary. So if they're hacking, uh, they were they were in it for Hillary. And you know, John, going back to this, I, I remember when I had told you about the whole political campaign and how this was going to be a, a bit of a circus. This whole campaign, and we had front row tickets to it. I, I truly believe it lived up to that hype. Uh, I believe it was spectacular. The uh, the left and the mainstream media, the collusion with the left and the collusion with the other agencies within the government, and what a, a big propaganda engine is is running. A well oiled, it just came, it just came crashing, came, burst loose from its chains, and busted down the barn door and went running out into the yard and, and chasing the geese and the chickens and everything all over the place. It was absolutely hysterical to watch this whole propaganda machine just absolutely become incontinent all over itself. I, I thought it was beautiful. I didn't even have the words, John. I only had one, and, and the word was excellent. <laughs> it, it was quite entertaining, to say the least. We had Trump giving us all those those uh, noteworthy sound bites. Um, I, I'd like, I liked those. I thought those were funny, even though he got a, uh, got a slap on the wrist there. I still thought that was actually pretty enter- entertaining, and yeah. I'm sorry to say so. Well, you know... I wish that it hadn't been necessary. See, here's, I think this is what people overlook with Donald Trump. <clears throat> They'll say, um, well, he's a misogynist because he talked, you know, aggressive sexy slash sexy stuff toward women. Okay. Well, that was the left that was going around, you know, braless, shirtless and everything else and, and, uh, and, uh, flaunting their sexuality. That was a leftist that was, uh, dancing naked in the gay pride parade, wasn't it? I don't think that was a Republican or a conservative. So the thing is, is that freedom, it, it, the simplest way to, to say it is just like this. The left is the height of hypocrisy. Freedom of speech is okay as long as it's speech that they agree with. They are the most totalitarian, uh, absolutely repressive religion that, that exists. I think they're every bit as dangerous as Islam. I don't think Donald Trump is a misogynist, by the way. I don't either, because let me tell you something. Donald Trump is a billionaire. Now, Many, many rock and roll disc jockeys will tell you that when they got off of work, particularly at night, there are four or five girls waiting to meet them. That's true. Well, in those days, there weren't four or five boys waiting to meet you, to have a date with you. This is how the world has changed. The left wants to champion all sorts of liberation, as long as it's degenerate. But if you turn around and throw their own stuff in their face, they run for their safe spaces because they're weenies. They're cowards and they're liars. And the way that they assert their position in the end, because they have no rationale behind it, is with violence. Which is why I'm saying, if they get violent with us, green light to get violent with them. And it's past time. Because we have cajoled. We have persuaded. We have whispered gently. We have reasoned. We have tried to be rational. We have tried to be logical. We have tried to present evidence that supports the reasons we believe the way we do. Ah, oh, they just won't have it. It's racist. It's bigoted. It's, 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 it's. And they're just completely full of it. And you know what I'm talking about when I say they're full of it. And the measure of a civilization is the distance it puts between itself and its it. I agree. And these people, there's some people are just no damn good. Some people are, yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, some people will yeah. lie, steal, and cheat. That's, they will. Yeah. And you can't convince them there's anything wrong with that. And so now we're taking it to the next level. It's like, well, look, it's, you know, really certain kinds of violence is justified if the, you know, dot, 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 fill in whatever you want to. All it is is it's just a con. And they and their con is fluid. They adjust it to, you know, well, we made a little bit of progress. We advanced five paces, but we had to fall back too. So let's adjust our attack a little bit. And then let's go forward again. Oh, look, we picked up the two we lost and an additional one. So we're making progress. Look what's become of the schools. They're graduating people now. They don't know how to write. Cursive is just so elitist. Cursive writing is just elitist. And yet you can go back and look at letters that are, wow, well, well over 150 years old from the, um, from the Civil War. And you see that just, these are just regular 
people, regular soldiers. They're not necessarily officers. And they're writing these beautiful letters to their wives and sweethearts and this beautiful penmanship. Every letter looks like literally like a work of art. But you see, that's elitist. Well, I bet they didn't feel too elitist when they were bleeding out. And that goes for somebody wearing a blue coat bleeding out or somebody wearing a gray coat and bleeding out, whether it was a black one or a white one, because blacks and whites fought on both sides of the Civil War because that war was never about slavery. Oh, they want you to think that it was, but it wasn't. That was the last thing on Abe Lincoln's mind. As a matter of fact, he waited until he had a major victory. I want to say, was it, was it Appomattox? No, Bull Run. Um, Manassas. Uh, before he even mentioned it, before he even played the slavery card. I'm not saying slavery is right. I'm saying the way it's been spun sure. as the driving wheel at the Civil War is just, it's just not true. It's not. But that's what they teach in schools. They don't teach anymore Captain John Smith, you know, at, uh, Plymouth Rock. Yeah, the, and, the uh, public school system is, is quite a joke nowadays. It's horrible. It's all about feelings, uh, being able to operate your genitals properly in, the, in their view, according to their instructions and supporting your government and accepting everything and everybody. By the way, quickly going back to the radio business and back to Coast really quickly here, I forgot to mention this. Are you aware that Art Bell is suing Michael Savage? Yeah, I heard about that. For defamation. Um, What's your opinion on that matter? Um, Michael never mentioned Art's name. Do you think he has the case here? You know, I didn't hear him say that. I didn't hear shots fired outside Art's house. I wasn't there. So I got to tell you, I, I just really don't have an opinion on it. Yeah, I don't really either. It seems like, um, I don't know, if you want to go after somebody for saying something like that, that's that's okay. Both are, are very wealthy competitors here. Um, both men I would not want to go to court with. I'll just state that. I don't know. You, you never know. Everybody's looking for a payday. I just, every, every, everybody's sure. trying to stay relevant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would have to agree. <laughs> so who knows? I, I, I listen to a little bit of Savage uh, frequently. Savage just Nation. Because it's, you know, and sometimes it's like, oh, Michael, really? Did you just say that? But I do it, too. I mean, no racehorse wins every time, right? Of course so, not. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've popped off and said some things that the, the meaning might have been a little clouded. I've said some stuff that some people found to be just downright offensive. But it's like, you just, if you, if you got a, a, a lick and take it and just go on. And sometimes you're going to step on a few toes. Yeah, and sometimes you can just make a mistake. That too. You know, I mean, it happens. There was another, pre- yeah, uh, John, there was another pressing issue here. I, I almost forgot to mention this, but this year you were scheduled to appear at the, I believe, the Global Pyramid Conference in May. And um, where, what happened, John? You you weren't there. No, uh, there was there was some logistical difficulty there. there. There was just a whole lot of miscommunication between the organizers and us. Well, that happens. And so, yeah, that's, it was just one of those deals. I mean, I didn't, I certainly didn't just deliberately stiff them. No, most of these but conferences, uh, John, I've noticed sometimes they're not ran properly. Yeah, when you get behind the scenes and you start talking with some people, and, and most people are really not willing to say anything about it because they don't want to be, they, would, they don't want to be catty about it, you know? They, uh. Um, sure. They don't want to be ugly. They don't want anything repeated. They don't want to start anything. But, uh, a conference within recent memory, there was a bunch of drama involved, uh, in, involving either two or three of the people who were scheduled to, uh, address the audience. And, you know, it, it's just, uh, there's, <laughs> there's always the backstage drama. Always. Oh, yeah. In any human endeavor, there's going to be the, there's going to be the dark side of, of whatever. I mean, even a rest, your favorite restaurant, that kitchen is a pirate ship. <laughs> exactly. <know>? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you one of the, one of the best books you could read if you want. It's a fast reading book and you'll learn some good things from it. And that's uh, Anthony Burdan's first book, A Kitchen Confidential. And, uh, really when, when you, and it is sort of important uh, that it's, Set. I, I think it's an that. important book because it's set in a kitchen where people prepare your food. You know, they're going to bring it to you on a plate and you're going to actually put it in your body. You know what I mean? That's kind of a big deal. That's pretty intimate. If, you, you know what I mean? So, but when you see how people behind there are just as human as anybody else, they create these masterpieces, but there's, but a lot of people are going through hell back there in the back and you'll never know it unless you read Bernan's book. And it was really quite an eye-opener. I'm going to have to keep that in mind. 
And since we are, oh, go ahead. Sorry, John. Look, if you want one little nugget from that book, I'll, I'll give it to you quickly. And it is that uh, somebody started some stuff about Anthony and um, he was beginning to think that maybe his job was uh, was being threatened. So he went to this old man who was his, his mentor, this old Italian man. Mm-hmm. And the Italian man, just he listened to him and he um, and then he finally said, it's OK. It means you have an enemy. But that's good because it means that you are important enough to have an enemy. That's true. But sometimes, sometimes we don't find a worthy opponent. Well, them's the breaks. The thing is, you just do what you do. You're not, you're not going to get through life without, uh, without a few bumps. You're not. That's you're not right. go through life without making a few enemies. Every once in a while, you'll hear, um, you'll hear one of the greatest things can be said about a person, which is, I never heard him say or her. I never heard that heard that person say a bad thing about anybody. That's, That's pretty rare. That's rare, yeah. I'd like to be one of those people, but I'm afraid it's too late now. Uh, same here. You know, I, I don't want enemies, and I never really considered any anything like that in, in life. But if, if you want me to be an enemy, go ahead, sign me up. I'll gladly accept. Uh, you know, that's that's kind of where I am today, John. If that's if that's the you know if that's the route you want to take and waste that sort of energy. You know, that's your problem. Yeah, well, what's that other one? The um, mm, high-minded people dis- discuss uh, ideals, middle-minded people discuss events, and small-minded people discuss people. That's true. So, but generally I reserve my negative commentary toward the act of the person rather than the person himself, unless it's, uh, for example, in the case of our president, that I think just epitomizes everything that is failure. That is flawed ideology and even more flawed execution. Well, John, he did say he was going to fundamentally change this nation. Yeah, he did a good job at that. He kept his word. He almost got there, didn't he? I think the, he got close. I don't think the American people caught on. I think they were throughout the course of his presidency, they have gradually caught on to more until by the time Hillary Clinton was ready to take the reins, they just went, eh. I think we better just uh, pull a cord on this train and go a different direction. I wish Donald Trump, but this goes back to what, what we were talking about 30 minutes ago. But Sure, let's get I, into that. I, well, I wish Donald Trump was, I like some of the things he says. Sure. I wish his style was a little bit different. It does seem a little bit. A little crass. Well, yeah, a little coarse maybe. Perhaps. But, you know, we've become a coarse nation. We have, truly. Fashion's dead, people giving each other the finger on the freeway, you know, people being rude, people treating women like, uh, sex know, objects. Chattel. Yeah, sex objects at best, but they, they treat them disrespectfully, you know, men do. And, you know, you have a choice now in society, uh, at, at least it appears this way. It's not necessarily really this way, but the general perception is that you got two kinds of guys. You've got uh, the ones that are light on their feet, and you've got the ones that are brutes. Take your pick. And then you've got women who have been made to feel that they have to dress and, and pretty much act like strippers or they won't be acceptable to the men that they'd like to attract. You also forgot to, life with. John, you also forgot to mention there's also Bruce Jenner type of guys out there. I mean, everyone's, I've heard uh, Bruce Jenner say a couple of things I thought were, were pretty intelligent, but well, I have to wonder what would make a former athlete Decide that no, you know, today I want breasts. Isn't that uh, crazy? Pretty dress. Jesus. Oh my gosh. What happened? How did that athlete turn into what he has become today? Was it nothing? Was nothing it the witches? The witches got you know, to him. The Kardashians. Bro, bro, I don't know who got to him. I don't know if I can't imagine that it's not some sort of a weird psyop that would make a man just go, nope, I'm wearing a dress today. This is bizarre. Yeah, these uh, these uh, these pumps are a little tight. And I mean, by the way, John, let me just say, I don't, I, I don't dislike the homosexuals out there. I, I'm just talking about Mr. Bruce Jenner, who was this, this athlete, this incredible athlete. And then later on, he basically self-destructed. The problem is, it's not only that. He self-destructed in front of a really, really large audience. Oh, I know. Nobody, see, nobody really cares what anybody else does with their private parts or with their body in general. But when you expose something like that to a huge audience and attract a, a collective consciousness about this one event, however mm-hmm. brief it might be, 
Then you have to wonder, hmm, indeed, Michael, why would he do such a thing? My God. Was it CIA or was it Satan? Somebody, some conspiracy theorist out there could say, yeah, what we do is we get one of the most outstanding athletes that they have. He must epitomize manhood. <laughs> he must be the quintessential heterosexual male. Und then I'm using a German accent so right. because they make, they make <laughs> the best mad evil scientists, right? So then what we do, we run a psychological operation on the American people. We take this epitome of masculinity and we put boobs on him and put him in a dress. Oh my God. And we prance him out all over the media. He will be on magazine covers. He will be on the radio. He will be on the television. He will be in the news, on every newscast, all through the houses. Symbol of masculinity turns into a strange man who wants to be woman now. But we celebrate him because he is willing to do the change. Do you see what the effect this will have with the minds of the people? Yeah, it confuses the hell out of everybody. Sure the hell does. That's what it's supposed to do. So it's either CIA or S-A-T-A-N. By the way, the so Germans were the ones is, who... Sorry. I was just going to say the Germans were the ones who pioneered the reel-to-reel tape recorder. Just a quick little fact there. You know, I still have a couple of studers. Really? Yeah. Wow. 67 and an AA20, sweetest sound and tape machines ever. I've had them a long time. <laughs> and you got to keep them up. And they don't like being turned off for very long either because you turn it back on and now you got to take it to the technician again. They don't like that. Once you turn that <laughs> old stuff on, tip to, tip to the wise. Uh, if you own vintage gear, turn it on and leave it on. Don't yes. turn it off and on. <laughs> That's true. And by the way, you know, when I last talked to you, I was using a different microphone. And since I updated my microphone now i'm using the re27 and i really like it a lot more than the re20 you know what i'll tell you something i have used so many different microphones that from the neumann 47 before it was even called a neumann it was called a telefunken with an external power supply sitting down there on the floor next to a mm. huge thing about i don't know 14 inches long and about three and a half inches in diameter i've only seen those in photos yeah, I've actually worked on one uh, downtown at uh, Channel 8 Television, WFAA. Oh, wow. Um, and I've used the, um, the the Neumann 67, the Neumann 87, and the AKG 414 is a great one. The those are good condensers. Yeah. All of that stuff. I've used all of those mics, the Chef's mics and even, even um, gosh, what was that one, uh, micro something, real weird looking thing. I've used Brule and Care microphones out of, I don't know, one of the Scandinavian countries. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what, you can't beat that RE27 for voice work. It's the best. I it's truly got, believe so. It's, it's got the, it's got the liquid clarity of a, of a Neumann and it's got the rip of a Sennheiser and it's perfect. I agree. I was really glad to have updated the microphone after talking to you about it. Good choice. You know, I've even got a Sony 800G. The black one with the big heat sink that comes off it. This thing was five grand 20 years ago. Jeez. And you know what? It's too much. It, it can hear a, 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 a cricket walking across the carpet from 20 feet away. <laughs> it can hear the wow. H in the word where. It's amazing. So it has its applications, but voice work ain't one of them. <laughs> yeah, right. For sure. You, you need a dynamic microphone. I would, I would say. I'm not sure I would even use it on a piano unless it was just a special piano, or you'll actually hear those hammers hitting the strings. Ooh. You won't just hear the sound from the string. You'll hear the hammer hit. That's pretty damn it, detailed there. Dude, it is extraordinary. I never heard a microphone ever that would pick up what this thing will. It picks up stuff the ear just ignores. It's weird. <laughs> so yeah. I quit using it. <laughs> I don't blame you. Yeah, I mean, You know, these RE27s also can pick up quite a bit. Especially if you're using a powerful preamp, that preamp always um, always gets you. Well, you know, there there are broadcast standards. I, I've used so much gear over the years. Uh, I've got a, actually a, I still have a Focusrite Red Range, number one, two, and three. I even got the zero plate. Oh, they're numbered, you know. And uh, you got four channels of mic input, two channels of EQ, and two channels of compression. It's the sweetest compressor ever. Still, some of these uh, music producers that do stuff like, uh, you know, like TSO and Armin Van Buren and people like that, mm -hmm. um, they might not find that compressor to be that that suited for their purposes. They might want another one. They, I mean, there's just a world of equipment out there. But um, all pricey too. Oh Lord, that's some expensive equipment. But, but Symmetrix still makes the best voice processor ever. You don't like anything from Neve? Oh, yeah, but it's not necessary. 
Do you think it's a little too much? Mm, not necessarily, but it's just that um, what is it going to be played through? What environment is it going to be played in? Is there going to be backing music? Or is it going to be a, a cold voice thing? Is it going over FM? Is it going over AM? Or is it going over the Internet? Now it's it's almost like hmm, just about anything will do because – there are so many different plugins and programs that mm -hmm. you can use that will, that will, um, fatten up the sound or thin it out or sure. de it or depop it or speed it up 2% or whatever. You know, you can just manipulate it until it's, uh, it's, it's just exactly what you wanted, but it's nothing like what the guy just read into the microphone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, by the way, uh, speaking of this, moving on quickly to headphones really quickly here. Um, what pair have you been using lately? I know both of us sit here for a great extensive amount of time. And um, as many people out there know, if you're sitting there with some headphones on, you might get a headache or you might start sweating behind the ears there after a lengthy time. Personally, I prefer the Bayer Dynamics. I like those. I have um, I have some, uh, what are those? They're Bayer uh, uh, 770s. Those are very good. Yeah, those are the ones I'm rocking. Yeah, the black ones. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great. Those are nice uh, and silky around the ears. I used to use some um, some Sennheisers, uh, the 250 HD something. Um, but the fact is, the most fun headphones were Koss back in the day. I don't even know if they make them anymore, but the but the, uh, the cups were were mm -hmm. plastic. And they were like khaki colored. And you could turn these things up so loud, but uh, that's not a good thing. And the Sonys came out for a while. The ones with just three numbers on them, you need to watch out for those. That's an older set of headphones. And you'd be doing good to find them again. If you look on the ends of this, the astute, they call them studio monitors. They're just right. like flat and they're black. Mm -hmm. If there's a four digit, a four character model number on it, you're okay. If it's a three digit number, if you have the same experience with it that I did, it will destroy your ears. And, I mean, it won't take very long to do it either. I, it will blow so much signal against your drums that that you'll lose your hearing. I, and I recommend to you that if you can, mm -hmm. you get yourself a voice processor that's got a little noise gate on it and keep a little speaker, a little speaker. Radio Shack even used to make these steel case speakers that were great for monitors. Just something that big, just a, a little a little Bose or something, just a single speaker where you can hear the the person that you're talking to and don't use headphones because they will destroy your ears. Jeez. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very quick uh, personal experience. Sure. Go ahead. I heard, I heard, can you hear this? I sure can. I was hearing that and I thought, what the hell is that? And I looked over my shoulder because it sounded like, you know, like I thought, is there some bizarre insect, you know, that just landed on me? <laughs> yeah. Feel it? Now it's snapping its pinchers. It's about to give me or what is it? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> it went away. And then I started hearing it again. And I thought, I said, do you hear this? I said this, I said this to my gal. <laughs> yeah. I said, sweetheart, I want to ask you something. Listen for just a second. Tell me if you can hear this. And she goes, yes, I can. And I went, oh, dear. So I went to the net and looked it up. And there's a certain kind of uh, tinnitus you can get where you can actually hear snapping noise that are audible to other people. And it's coming out of your ear. Oh, so wow. Went, okay. I think we're good here. And I took those headphones off. And the last couple of days, I put them back on. I really needed them today because... Um, and these are the Audio Technicas uh, yes. special edition, butterscotch and blue. Uh, yeah, I've seen those, yeah. Nice. Yeah, they're pretty cool. And they were on sale because apparently nobody wanted them. So I, I went up to Guitar Center and just, just bought them, you know. Right. A hundred bucks or something. Um, Good price. Yeah, it was great. But um, I had to listen closely through the phones because he's, you know, I'll tell you what, his uh, his English is way better than my Egyptian. But he had a, th a very thick accent. Mm -hmm. and, and you could hear, you could understand him, but you had to be able to hear him. And I couldn't really hear him through this little Yamaha speaker that I had for a uh, for a monitor off to the off to the side. So I put the phones on. But my advice to anybody is, if you want to lose your hearing, use headphones a lot, and you will. <laughs> Very true. I mean, it will happen to you. Before long, your ears will be ringing louder. It's louder than than our voices talking together now are, and it's not good. That's what drove even Ian Punnett off of coast to coast. That's it's, true. He got tinnitus. So tinnitus. Bad, he, he couldn't hear anything. You know. And John, I, I played in, in bands most my early years, and I would play loud music all the time. And, I, and I'm pretty damn sure my left ear is is paying the price for it now. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. My uh, my, it's interesting. My right ear, if I had to re rely on my right ear for just general hearing, I wouldn't hear 
70% of what was going on. But this right here now, it's been clobbered so hard over the years that it hears things that other people don't hear. Oh my. But they are in fact there. I'm not talking about supernatural stuff. I'm just saying sure. it picks up very interesting frequencies. But, um, I rode a Harley for years, still ride one, but I wear, I use earplugs now. That's probably because, a smarter uh, idea. Well, your, your pipes are on the right side. You're always standing with your right side turned to your Marshall double stack, you know, mm-hmm. and you're 10 feet away from it. And as the night goes on and you're playing, it doesn't seem all that loud. It's sort of like when you're in the studio, you keep turning your headphones up. Yeah. The moment that you reach over to turn your headphones up, you probably need to take them off. But certainly if you're going to continue to wear them, do not turn them up. Definitely. And, um, John, are you still using an, an analog mixer or are you using a digital mixer nowadays? Uh, for what? For our program? Sure. Uh, we, well, everything winds up getting digitized as soon as it goes into post. Mm-hmm. So we just stick with analog stuff. It's fine. I see. I'm thinking about moving to an all digital board. Well, they're excellent. I mean, you're not going to go wrong with it. Yeah. They seem to work really good nowadays. You know, after a while, I read this article a long time ago about this this man who was just featured. He's this genius engineer out in California. And he had d- developed this very special EQ for this band. And they did this record, and he went on and on and on of all this technical stuff about where it was cut and where the threshold was and where the release was on mm-hmm. the compressor and the EQ, all this BS. And the band sucked. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not yeah. good. So what I'm trying to say, I mean, I'm using the word sucked, okay? And sure. Real bad. And so um, it's just what sounds good. I'll tell you a quick story. A movie trailer house in L.A. when I was living out there mm-hmm. called me up and said, <clears throat> say, now, we want to ask you something. I said, okay. He said, when you do an ISDN transmission to us, by the way, folks, that's just a box that goes in a rack. It's got two phone lines in it, mm-hmm. and each one of them will carry 64 kilohertz. You can cross the streams and make it a mono stream of 128, which is what you got on the original iPod. That's basic CD quality, 128 kilobits per second. Okay, that's it. Word. It goes, it goes, when I would, when we, when we would do a session with you, yours is the best ISDN sound we have ever heard. I know we don't expect you to give away any of your trade secrets, but could you tell us what you're using? I said, yeah, I'm using a little um, Sennheiser MKH-40 with a uh, little Mackie 1202 on the front end. Uh, I actually had a, a Mackie 1202, and he goes, well, what are you using on the front end? I said, just the Mackie 1202, which is like the entry-level Mackie. Sure, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the basic uh, like little mixer. Like or 12 or something. Yeah. And, uh, and he goes, you're using the Mackie as the front end? I said, yeah. I never heard from him again. Oh, wow. What I should have said was, well, <clears throat> George Massenberg himself designed a circuitry just for me after taking extensive voice prints. It's an absolute one-of-a-kind processor. I should have told him that, but it wasn't true. It was just a Mackie 1202 because I got it to where it sounded right. I could have used anything. I mean, I was I was five minutes away from... Sunset Boulevard. They got every piece of gear you could possibly want on that street, or at least that's that's right. those days they did. Mm-hmm. I mean, Sam Ash is over there, and Guitar Center's down there, and they're, I mean, they're all over. And specialty stores everywhere, and strange little shops where they make special gear in the back, and one at a time, and stuff like this. But I tried a bunch of that stuff. It was thousands and thousands of dollars, and it didn't sound, in some cases, as good, and none of it sounded better for this purpose. Now, I wouldn't use a Mackie 1202 to record, you know, some, uh, you know, to record Yo-Yo Ma, you know. Sure. Some fancy acoustically tuned room. But if it sounds good, I picked up a, a guitar one time in L6, a Gibson L6, and a guy named Gary Bruner. Fought a lot of him back in those days. He's from Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, he was a musician, and I'm sure he still is. And, and I, he said, here, try this. And I played it for a minute. I said, you know, Gary... I don't even have any business picking up this guitar, let alone playing it. And he said, man, it doesn't matter how you do it as long as you do it. And that's the truth. It doesn't matter how you do it as long as you do what you, what you aim to do. Yeah. Now, these little artists out there, they, they have the finest brushes, the finest brushes, and they can't sell a single piece of art. And then you get a Picasso, and he takes a time-lapse uh, 
for a time uh, extended exposure photograph of himself creating a minotaur with a glowing cigarette. He just moves it around with his hand. Well, that's the one that people remember, not the one that was painted with the fancy brushes. Right. You just do, you just do what you got to do. And if the result is, is what you wanted, then you're done. It's all about the architect. Yeah, pretty much. It's all about what is enough and what is too much and what is not enough. So you just eliminate uh, not enough and too much. And what you'll wind up with is hopefully what will satisfy you. And since we're our own worst critics, our own harshest critics, you know, so you tend to sample it sometimes around other people. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? But in the end, you're going to make the decision. Yeah, exactly. Your opinion is the final one. Yeah, I could go on and on about this. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to know why when I plug in my electric guitar tuner, when I click it to A, I have to twist my string and tighten or loosen it until the needle comes up on 440. And I wanted to know why it's like that. I wanted to know why it, this is, and I, I went to every studio in Dallas. Boy, there were a bunch of them those days. There were good ones too. Mm-hmm. But nobody could answer this question. I said, where, who decided that A was going to be this? And somebody said, tuning fork. And I went, you just got gonged. No. Who, who said the tuning fork had to vibrate at that, at that frequency and make that sound? Mm, didn't know, didn't know. Well, Manny P. Hall, I believe, wrote this book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Yes. And I got that, I got that book as a gift one time and I was reading the section on Pythagoras. And it is Pythagoras who, by listening to the planets emit their tones, came up with his diatonic scale, which is ten notes, by the way. And I thought, what? And then I thought, ah, Horst, the planets. You know, that, that symphony, right? No, not, not Horst, uh, Holtz. Yeah, the planets. You know, he did a suite, a symphonic suite in celebration of planets. Well, I'm not sure very many people got it, but the planets are where the musical notes come from, according to Pythagoras, the first philosopher and also a spectacular mathematician. So well, there you go. If you want a new idea, read a really old book. True. And that sort of reminds me of David Sarita. I believe he He's talks a cool about, guy, isn't he? yeah, I really like him. He talks about these perfect tones. Yeah, there's a, there's an amazing world out there. We've really been, uh, our, our progress. It's been suppressed, been, John. Truly. It's been terribly suppressed. We, we've absolutely been retarded. We have not been advanced at all, but we're, we're crashing through that. But, you know, I was talking with Dr. Pry, Dr. Peter Vincent Pry. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. You know him. He heads up the whole, Watch out for EMPs and yes. nuclear this and CIA that. He's got a CV that's six feet long, you know. He's great. 16 point font. He's amazing. Mm-hmm. And, um, what I asked him was, do we have, he had a great time on the program by all accounts being his own account because he seldom gets the chance to, um, just expound a little bit on things and, yeah. and amplify some of the things he wants to talk about. Cut loose. Yeah. And the question now is, do we have time now that we know how screwed we are? Do we have enough time? Time's always against us. Yeah. Do we have enough time to, to get our stuff together before it's simply too late and we're going to have to suffer some sort of cataclysmic event because we were so woefully remiss in our awareness and our preparedness and our, and, and in our innovation when we, when we could have been and it was well e- within easy grasp, but we just didn't do it because we occupy ourselves with stuff like you know, gay marriage, which I think is completely ridiculous. I, I'm sorry. If you want to be together, be together. You know, I, I, I know and work with some guys on, who are in the, in the uh, industry of, that require a VO and other things that, uh, sure. they've been together 25, 30 years. They don't parade down the street talking about it. They're not married. They think it's stupid. It was a political agenda. It's not about suppressing somebody's feelings. You know, if you have, if, if a person has these feelings and, and they can't help these feelings, well, you know, what are you going to do? Destroy the person? Well, certainly not. But you don't have to turn it into a political agenda. That, that's where, when, as soon as it becomes political, no matter what it is, that's when whatever environment you're operating in, that's when it begins to suffer. When politics kick in, in the camera department at Walmart, so to speak, or whether the politics kick in in the, in the, uh, the motorcycle gang or the rock and roll band or the symphony or the, or the corporation that makes widgets. As soon as politics kick in, that's when retardation begins because now it's about this imaginary agenda and it's not about the product at all anymore. So we're, we're beginning to win 
we're beginning to win some battles. The question is, can we win enough battles to to keep the war from going any farther than it is? And maybe just if we can't win it, maybe we can just call a truce and go for and a real truce and go forward. If we can't do that, then we simply have to crush the opposition so that we can go forward. Because if we don't, we won't be able to go forward. And, well, and the people who come up behind us won't be able to go forward either. It'll be even worse for for the generations that come behind us. Yeah, I really hope there's no upcoming war, by the way, John. Well, that's one of the things that Dr. Pry and I were discussing. The, uh, by all accounts, we're, uh, we're not in very good shape. We've, our forces are drawn down to pre-World War II levels. Correct. That ain't good. It's not good. Uh, now, you hear on the news, I heard as recently as last night, somebody on Fox was saying, you know, our nuclear weapons are in tip-top shape and all this. Well, they're not. In fact, there's there's some questions as to whether or not they'll even work. Do I know this for a fact? Well, no, I haven't climbed down to one of the silos and inspected one of the damn things. But, but the point is that we're hearing both stories. I'd rather go with what Dr. Pry had to say, to say rather than something I hear over the television. You know what I mean? It's just kind of stands to reason. He says, no, the Soviets and the Chinese have been working on this stuff day and night, night and day. We haven't. This administration has held everything back, scaled everything back. So I the don't, question is, John, I don't strong again before they hit us. That's I really don't trust the Russians, by the way. Well, I think we need to remember that uh, the Russians have suffered. They are some tough people. Well, that they are. I'm not going to uh, not going to deny that. If we would have to well, go uh, hand-to-hand combat against the Russians, John, we would get our ass kicked. Yeah, I'm afraid it'd be pretty bad. I mean, our, our forces are very capable. But uh, see, the thing is that the Russians have suffered like this country has not suffered since the Civil War. They lost millions of people uh, in World War II. It was it was like savagery beyond belief. And people who were involved in that conflict on, on either side, those that survive and, and are alive today, they won't even talk about it. They won't talk about it because it was awful it was like beyond belief horrible sure and these people live through that yeah. and they're indoctrinated from an early age you got kids carrying these you know multi-barreled things like that that guy took on that thing in predator with the schwarzenegger <laughs> you know, that minigun they got those they're, they're yeah. wearing those to school that's true and we're not like that we're uh well actually we're, let me let me stop you there colorado actually is going to allow teachers to carry guns <clears throat> so this well, progress probably a pretty good idea i think that might be a good idea well, the whole point is, and this is another point that Dr. Pry made, mm-hmm. and I told him I hadn't heard that expression since my father spoke it, and it was rugged individualism. There's nothing wrong with rugged individualism. There's nothing wrong with being fit, with uh, with being the most that you can be, to be self-reliant and, and know how to, if you have to go without uh, the the accoutrements of modern living, uh, running water, electricity, uh, grocery store, if you have to, if you have to survive, You'd know how to do it. You could fish. You could hunt a little bit. You could, if you had to pop a squirrel or, I don't know, a gerbil if you're hungry enough, whatever. You know, but how many people can do that now? The Russian people, they had to learn how to survive. That's why they call it the World War II guys and gals, the greatest generation. And they're a different breed. These were depression kids. I mean, there was deprivation. They didn't have anything. And they had to make do. They had to survive. And they were tough. And we're not. That's a different breed of people right there. They were not tough at all anymore. Uh, brutality and and um, crude base behavior passes for tough now, and it's it's that's not toughness at all. So I'm a little worried about it. Sure. And one of uh, Trump's criticisms right now in the media has been the daily intelligence briefings that he has been turning down, stating that he's a smart person. But um, what exactly do you what do you take from that sort of statement? Even well, though things are constantly changing, things are always constantly changing. Yes, and number one, he hasn't been taking office yet. Number two, True. Obama's still the guy with his finger by the button. Uh, number three, he is, is probably going to – when he, he's one of these guys that's all the way in or all the way out. And as soon as he gets into office, I think he'll be all the way in. And I'll also say that I'm not looking at Donald Trump as some kind of a messiah. That's what everybody wants, but – there's only one. He hadn't come back yet, to the best of my knowledge. So. Sure, and I'll just state this. I'm not for – I don't have a dog in the fight. I don't really like any of the king's men, John. I'm a bit of a rebel here. Well, yeah, and I'm, this is about the third time I've started this. I'm not sure that I've finished it, but 
<clears throat> I wish his style was a little smoother. But as we have seen, people don't necessarily respond to a smooth talking salesman unless it's a minority figure who's come to save us. Then we'll listen because the fact is, subconsciously, I believe, we are amazed that a minority figure can speak this eloquently and be so persuasive. As persuasive as Nat King Cole was singing a song. As persuasive as, uh, Billy Holiday or, uh, or, um, uh, as passionate as Jimi Hendrix on the guitar. We're just absolutely amazed. But you get some non-minority member that gets up there and speaks eloquently about what they're going to do to the country. And they're immediately going to begin criticizing uh, that person because they're, they're too much the gentry. They're too, lofty in their in their thoughts and in their language you know donald trump speaks to everybody when he says something everybody from the highly educated to the not educated very much at all understand exactly what he's saying uh how this will play on the world scene i don't know uh vlad putin's a pretty straightforward guy uh, there's nothing in it for vlad putin to get into a into a nuclear war with us but it, but I don't think that we'd appreciate it very much if suddenly Russian tanks were lining up along the Texas-Mexico border with the cannons pointed our way. And that's what we've done to, to him and his country in Ukraine. And everybody knows there was a CIA takeover of, of that uh, of that government and the installation of that um, that puppet dude that would go along with whatever NATO wanted. You know, everybody's in it for themselves. NATO wants to protect itself, and, and the individual countries would, would sort of like to protect themselves, and, and they've gotten pulled into this jackpot. They didn't vote to be members of NATO or anything else. So, and, the, and then you combine this with this unbelievable influx of, of immigrants all over Western Europe. They tried to do it in Eastern Europe, and the Eastern Europeans wouldn't have it. Well, so so what is this? Is there some secret cabal somewhere that goes, okay, let's agitate the, the Americans and the, uh, it, it looks to me like the Americans, the NATO side of things are, are the aggressors and the agitators. Yes. Oh, they're all ticked off at Russia because Assad said, would you come in here and help me get rid of these people? Well, the free Syrian army is, is, uh, those are, that, those are rebel forces, right? I mean, I guess. So let's see, who are we fighting? Was ISIS trying to get Assad too? Yep, I think he was. So if the Russians are blowing up the opposition to Assad and he's blowing up ISIS, we're mad at them about that. Why? And then we find out that Saudi Arabia and Qatar are providing financial and logistic support to ISIL, which is the same thing. They just call them, call them ISIL. So does Barack Obama. Doesn't call them ISIS. So it's either a huge mess or it's a very, very carefully orchestrated operation disguised as a mess. It almost yeah, seems think, fake, though, know, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It, it, um, this does, where does this feels where scripted, does, John, I have to say. Well, where does mainstream media get their news? Where do they get their information? Occasionally, they'll dress somebody up in a helmet and a flag jacket or whatever and send them out there to do a report. Right. But where do they actually get their news? They get it from official press briefings, and nothing's going to be revealed in those press briefings that they don't want to be revealed. Then it's going to get lawyered. And then it's going to be given to the to the uh, mainstream media presenter, and they're going to put their personality into it, and, and that's what we get. But the important part is what's not given to those reporters in the press briefings. That's the real stuff, and they're simply not going to tell us that ever. Yeah, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid so. It seems like everyone, like we mentioned earlier, has some sort of agenda, and we really don't know who's telling the truth and who isn't. It's quite scary. Well, we may have reached that point where their agenda is survival, because, again, it could be that we're seeing the thrashings around because we're not seeing the worry looks and the white knuckles because we're not see sitting in those meetings that precede the press briefings to mainstream media. So we I mean, we're, we're pretty much flying blind here. We, we can only operate on you have to sense what's credible when you're listening to it. Yeah, I got to discern from the info from in front of the shiny bright lights that yeah. cloud our judgment. Yeah. And I mean, if, if you uh, com compare what's being said on, see, there's so many left leaning channels now, CNN and MSNBC are almost one of the same. So what do you have left? You got Fox news left. You know, Obama goes out there and says, well, you know, I think I got in a lot of trouble because everybody, you know, Fox news is on. Everywhere. It's like, dude, what does that tell you? If Fox news is on everywhere, nobody's holding a gun. To anybody's had to turn it on. So they're listening to it. You did not say, well, everywhere I go, CNN is on. 
You didn't say, well, everywhere I go, it's either CNN or MSNBC. No, it's because we see through what you're doing. We don't know exactly what you're doing, but we know you're doing something, and we see the effect of what you're doing every once in a while. We see that what you told us you were going to do did not happen. I mean, if you use that old tire, if you like your insurance plan, you can keep it. Well, no, you can't. Well, what if you, you can keep your doctor. Well, no, you can't. It'll be much less expensive. Uh, no, it's double and triple and worse in some cases. So what else have you got besides a genius health care plan? If you've managed the rest of the operations of this country a, a tenth as badly as you did this, this health care system, we got a problem. <laughs> okay. So you're going to tell us that, well, I kind of screwed up on the health care program, but all this other stuff I did was total genius. And the only thing genius that you did was screw our country up. And, and the genius in it is because we believed you. I didn't. But um, enough people believed you to allow you to continue to do it. What kind of sense does it make to just let millions of unknown people come into your country, then give them money and transport to where they're going? And once they get to the churches, for example, because a lot of the churches are working this too. The federal government is not allowed to know where those churches send those people. Really? Really. I've not heard of that before. That sounds insane, I'm sure. Please check it for me. You'll find out it's true. That's intense. Yep. Hmm. And, it's all, and again, that's because it's politics. Now, these churches can do this, and they will take care of the migrants. They'll take care of the refugees. But once the feds drop them off at the churches... That's the end of the Fed's involvement. We don't even want to know where they are. In fact, you are not allowed to tell us where you're sending them. What kind of sense does that make? That makes no zero. sense. Yeah. No. But that, look, there's there's a hundred things like that. It's That's depressing. It is depressing. Uh, do I have any idea? I think we're going to enter four years now of, of some real tumult. I think we're going to experience some, some um, high... Crazy. I was just about to ask you where you see things going here for this great nation in the next four years. I hope not war. Trouble comes from where you least expect it. So where do I least expect the trouble to come from? Mm, hard to say. Will it be a solar flare? Will it be, um, you know, an escalating situation with Russia? I, You know, it goes without saying that I could be wrong. It's always fun but, to speculate, though. Yeah, I'm not sure that that worrying about World War III is is um, really warranted at this time. I, I don't think a nuclear exchange between Russia and the United States is really on the table. I, I, I just don't see how that would benefit anybody. If even one nuclear weapon goes off on the Russian side, it's going to be miserable. And if even one of them goes off over here, it's going to be miserable. So, I mean, unless it's just like disturbing a fire ant nest, what they really want to do is just crater the U.S. with an EMP, drive, you know, knock us back to about 1600 sure. technology-wise, you know, and then <laughs> yeah. swarm the country with with uh, foreign soldiers, annihilate everybody, and take over. And I don't think that's going to go very well for them either. I agree. So. Yeah, I don't think that's um, an outcome I could. see. I mean, if they whack us all out with neutron bombs or whatever, you know, then... Yeah, sure. We have lots of guns here, though. Well, it won't do you any good, though, if you're dead. That's Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah, doubt. You've already been neutroned out of existence. By the way, uh, John, let, let's have a little bit of fun here. Um, I'm sure you're, you're quite aware, very well aware, of all these popular dating websites and apps out there. I've talked about this on the show plenty of times, and... I'm always amazed of the numbers of people that are on these things. And according to statistics here, about 44% of Americans felt online dating was a good way to meet people. And, and this number just keeps going up and up and up and up uh, throughout the years here. It's quite fascinating. And at a time, I was even making fun of Coast to Coast AM for their paranormal date, uh, their little website thing, their dating site. But once I started, you know, once I started looking into the numbers, I thought, holy hell, there's a market for this. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've, I think I've experienced a couple of paranormal dates. In oh my goodness. My life. Have they, you? They, yeah. They didn't last very long. Oh Lord. I'll, what, uh, I'll be right back. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then of course you're not. Uh, uh, yeah. I think a date with Mr. Nori would probably be pretty paranormal, don't you? Maybe. Uh, it might be. Uh, <laughs> you never know. Well, 
It's just like Pokemon Go. Oh, my goodness. We just talked about that the other day. Well, you know, I haven't heard anything about it in the last few weeks, so maybe it's kind of like over with. It's dying down. Yeah. You know, it's just it's just fad stuff. People don't realize that um, that everything is in your mind. There is no reality outside consciousness. Neville Goddard was talking about that in the 30s as far as the, part of the new uh, thought movement. And um, so when people look at pornography, what it does is um, it neutralizes their sexual drive because it's all in your mind anyway. Sure. That's why Russians and Germans make the best hookers. Um, so I've heard. That's just a joke, but I think there's some truth to it. There might be. Um so if you've already put these images in your mind and you've looked at one of these sites where there are, you know, a lot of girls on there or whatever, whatever you're interested in, then how much sexual energy are you expected to have after you've seen all of this for a while to the point where, okay, there, there's something that made you look at it to begin with and there's something that, that kept you there for however many minutes you watched it. True. So, so when you make the decision that, okay, I've watched enough, what does that mean? What it means is your, your, I would think it would mean your sexual energy and impulse has been diminished. Yeah. So in other words, when these young guys, you know, in high school age and, and the college age get into this porn stuff, they're putting a governor on their, on their, their sexuality and they become after a while sort of indifferent you to, could, uh, yeah. women and, and open themselves up to anything that will provide some sort of stimulation, even if it's bisexuality. Exactly. I mean, that's just what happens. Or even Everybody's, bestiality. Well, yeah. I mean, something that will, that will, satisfy that that primordial urge i mean don't I mean, don't we true. see this in uh rock stars sometimes too by the way they they go through all these women and all of a sudden they end up with a man yeah i don't know about too many uh, instances of that actually but well but, i do uh, but i won't speak on those men <laughs> it was pretty weird when uh, when a, a well-known guitar player from one of the mega bands back in the back from back in the day just kind of came out and and said it was that way, but I mean, we should have known that, uh, I mean, nobody really cares if Elton John's gay. You of know course I mean? not. Cause he'd, he'd play that piano and wear those glasses and sing all those, you know, get back funky cat or Benny and the Jets or something. He's practically singing show tunes anyway. John, I'll so. give you a, a little a secret here. Uh, this between us, by the way, John Travolta used to come out here to El Centro. He used to fly out here and, and meet a, a young, officer of, of a law a law enforcement officer a very young one by the way and they would meet and, and um reportedly they would be seen holding hands and mm -hmm. this is what i was told and this was many many years ago by other law enforcement officers and i have plenty of friends who work in law enforcement plenty of them listening right now and yeah. they could all confirm the story that happened long ago but I've always thought, you know, it's not a big deal, but it's interesting to see that there's lots of people out there that live these double lives. Well, yeah, but the thing is, is that we all want that the people, for the people that we see on the screen to be the same people we see at the, uh, at the grocery store. And they're, they're never not. No, I mean, my, uh, one of my relatives, a big fat man named Orson Welles, mm -hmm. uh, said once upon a time, well, actors aren't really anything, are they? <laughs> because right. they're not playing themselves exactly. they're, playing, they're playing somebody else they're playing a fictitious or a real character but they're pretenders because they're pretending and so you know let me put it to you this way Tom Cruise is supposed to be you know out there mm -hmm. and um right and that's uh, I, I still like his movies me too uh, sure Tom Cruise has got his own P51 Mustang and he can fly the hell out of it and Travolta's a pilot so I would say if it was to, if I was squadron commander and I was going to take on some, uh, some good shooters in uh, airplanes with, you know, like say red stars on their wings, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't care if the whole damn squadron was queer, if they could fly like these guys. Exactly. Because that's the job. What they do off the job, I couldn't care less. I, I'm serious. I couldn't care less. Now, if we, if we're going to make them the poster boys for, America, turn gay. You know, it's a great lifestyle. You'll love it. You know, and gay people always vote for this candidate because he's for gay people and they don't call us gay for nothing. Do you want to be happy? Turn gay. If they start doing that, now, now we've got a little bit of an issue. Sure. But otherwise, we don't. It's just, do they do the job or do they not? That's the important thing there. 
That's the only important thing is how are they to the people around them? I don't care what they do in their personal lives. Now, because yeah. when it becomes political, when it becomes a political instrument, there's a potential problem. Now, John, going back to uh, radio here, let, let's talk a little bit about your show. And I'm just curious here. Are there any favorite guests you've had on that you just love having on? Well, um, oh yeah. The fact of the matter is, is that most of them are, um, could come into the favorite category. Uh, James O'Keefe certainly was a favorite guest. Dr. Pry is a favorite guest. Um, Patrick Wood, uh, and his, uh, and his crew over there at, uh, technocracy.news. Uh, that would include, uh, uh, Debbie Bachia Galupi. She's, she's great. Brindy Richards is great. Um, the, uh, South Africa, the truth about South Africa, uh, lady. What about Dr. Richard Allen Miller? Oh, he's, I, I love Rich. I love him. Trip. I love him so much. You know, he wanted me to call him and, um, I called him and, and he seemed to be preoccupied having a great time. Yeah, yeah, he's so funny. But, you know, Joseph P. Farrell is a great guy. Gerald oh, Valente yeah. is a great guy. L.A. Marzulli is great. I mean, oh, I yes. don't want to keep naming him because I'm going to leave somebody out. And uh, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But the people who come on our program are absolutely spectacular. And Rebecca Roth. People, some, Rebecca Roth, excellent. DJ Welsh with Level 9 News. Yeah. Uh, you know, the you've Jaded some, Home Girl. You've had some great so, guests, by the way. Uh, I'm telling you, man, I feel so richly blessed that they would come on the program and talk to me. It's great because, I mean, I'm just, what you're hearing now is just, and I'm not on right now. I'm, I'm on with you, and it's just a couple of guys talking with, you know, a few tens of thousands of our closest friends. But So maybe I'm just only half on. But, I mean, the program is conducted with, uh, you know, with, a, I think, a, a high level of uh, respect for whoever may be listening. So I may get a little bit naughty, but I try not to get nasty. Sure. I may get a little bit aggressive, but I, I try not to get hateful because there are a lot of different personalities out there. And, and the object is to to have them find value in the program, not to offend them and drive them away. You know, we don't want to do that. So sure. So we keep it as real as we keep it as real as people can stand. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> that that reminds me of uh, the time I go and, and spar um, in boxing. Sometimes I get in the ring with a couple people and they ask me, um, how hard we're going to go. And usually I say, hit me how, um, hit me as hard as you want to be hit. That's what I tell them. Then what happens? They don't really hit me too hard. Yeah. Yeah. There you That's go. what ends up happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> how about this? Okay. That's fine. So you want to play touch football? I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's always fun. By the way, have you had any bad guests turn up on your show? Mm, well, I wouldn't call them bad guests, but I would call their subject matter to be... A little tanked a little? Mm, yeah, it's a little strange. I, I draw the line when somebody tells a story about having to amputate their own arm. Oh, my and God. And corpsman comes to res- rescue them, and the corpsman cuts off his own arm, gets that arm attached to the person who was the first one to lose their arm, and then the corpsman dies, and they make their way out of this this poop storm that they're in uh, as a super soldier. Are you serious? Also, yeah, and sometimes somebody come, somebody came on one time and and had a little uh, had a little facial paralysis symptom there, and told me they'd been hit with a directed energy weapon. And of course, my first thought was, then, well, mm. why are you not a pile of ashes? Oh my goodness! You mean you were hit with a directed energy weapon? Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, that that sounds like what you would call Bravo Sierra. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on a pretty spectacular level. Ooh, that yeah, that's pretty brutal. Yeah, but I mean, even that is fun. It's just like it's entertaining. Really, yeah, I mean, we we can have fun with some of those. Like, really, my God, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I had this guy call me on coast to coast one night. It was so funny. He goes, "I got grabbed, man," and I said. Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? Goes, I got grabbed in the middle of the night, and it ain't funny. Ooh. Said, well, tell us about it. And that's all he could tell us was, I got grabbed. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I wouldn't expect you to get those kind of calls more prevalent on Coast than you would on your own show. No, we don't take calls. Oh. We take them on the Arc Midnight. I do the uh, 10 to Midnight. As a matter of fact, we'll do it tomorrow night from 10 to Midnight on uh, KLIF, Cliff.com. It's a famous uh, set of call letters in, in Dallas. It's an AM station, and it's on uh, iHeart and <clears throat> TalkStream Live and Red Nation Rising and uh, 
I think I might have mentioned KLIF.com. They stream it too. Mm-hmm. So, um, we just do two hours because that's all that was available. Uh, two hours is to expand sometime in the future. Two hours isn't so bad though. I mean, we are a nation of ADD, so can't go yeah. too long. Well, I'll tell you what, they go by fast at two hours and, and, uh, it's the same drills it was at Coast. It's, um, I like to say it's some, uh, it's a good talk, a few good tunes and a good time. And that's what it is. I even played JoJo Gun on there. I even played some of my own music on there. Oh, wait. So it's, uh, By the way, John, yeah. speaking of your own music, didn't you just compose some sort of new track recently? I resurrected a couple of tracks that I recorded some years ago, and um, so I've got my own channel on, on, on something. I don't know what it is <clears throat> because um, Milady set it up for me. Ah, oh, nice. Well, John, if you do um, have some music, you could send it my way, and I'll, I'll have that running on the 24-7, 24/7 network here. Well, that'd, that'd be great. I'll, I'll get you. Uh, I'll get you a couple of MP3s. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll I'll have those running up here on that network, which is always fun when you have your own stream. You could do basically whatever you want. Yeah, it's you know some guitar-based music. I think it's pretty interesting, and, and people seem to like it. Okay, so I mean, uh, I'm not trying to be Led Zeppelin. I just thought, hey, you like this? And they, they said, yes, yeah, we, we do. So we we put it out there. I think it's gonna. It might already be on iTunes. I know that one of them, the, the theme song to our program, uh, is an instrumental that, uh, that I recorded using a Roland, an old Roland Jupiter 8. I remember those, yes. Man, those things are going for almost nine grand now on eBay. eBay, yeah. So, uh, and I said, hmm, I think this would be a good track for our program. So I used that and then, uh, and then put that out there and, and, uh, people seem to like it. They, uh, they download it quite often. So it's, uh, you know, it's it's gratifying to make a piece of, of music when you use your real name on the air and you say the things that you want to say. And you put yourself out on the clothesline. You're, you're going to attract some praise and you're going to attract some severe criticism. And, yeah. and in some cases, even a little bit of hatred. The same thing goes for music. I mean, I can't believe mm-hmm. Keith Emerson of Emerson, Lake and Palmer actually killed himself because he didn't feel that he could perform to the expectations of his of his um, his audience. Yeah, isn't that crazy? And, yeah, and people will post this stuff. One guy posted, I wish he'd just quit playing. It's like, dude, I'll tell you what. Here's a vintage Roland and Jupiter 8. Why don't you sit down here and let's hear some of your music before you start criticizing somebody like that. You know, and Emerson just took his, his art so seriously that he just checked out because yep. he couldn't make any more art. He tuned out. He and, the, he and the art were one. So I just say to hell with it. Here's a song. You know, it's, it's just music. It's nothing to bust a gut over if you like it. Yeah. I'm glad. But if you don't, mm-hmm. well, I, I know what you'll do. You won't listen to it anymore and you'll move on to something you do like. It's a world of music out there. It's awesome to be a musician though. Having something that you create in your mind and have that manifest. That's always a beautiful thing. Well, it has been said when you see pictures or scenes, you should hear music in your head. And when you hear music, you should see pictures in your head. So I kind of use that as the rule of thumb. If I don't see any pictures, when I hear the music, I play some music until I do see some pictures. Or if I see some pictures and it, some sort of a little friendly or sometimes even unfriendly, a chord progression begins to run through my head, then I'll go and find a recorder and an instrument and plug it in and make a rough and see what can be developed. And if it goes nowhere, then I'll just abandon it. And if it goes somewhere, then I'll continue until it's finished and move on to something else. I mean, you just do what you do, right? Yeah. Got to keep it like, moving. Life on planet Earth, it's all really, in the final analysis is all just something to do. Definitely. And um, going back to, um, I guess, going back to radio really quickly here, where do you see the future of your show going in about a year or two? Do you plan on perhaps doing something newer in terms of, I guess you could say, marketing? Are you going to try to get into anything else to further expand your brand here? You know, I hope you don't... Um interpret this this answer as some kind of a dodge but the fact is is that i owe it all to the uh for better or worse you know i owe it all to the one who put me here on planet earth and gave me whatever skill i have to be able to do whatever it is that i do uh, all of this was was just seeing a stepping stone appear and just have enough faith to step on it and wait until another one appeared so uh, certainly we're always kicking around new ideas, but um, I don't anticipate any radical changes from what we're doing. But if it turned out that it was a really good radical change and um, the members who support us um, 
are okay with it. In fact, before we do things, a lot of times, uh, we'll ask people what they think of it. Much the same way that Donald Trump was saying, which do you like better, made in America or made in the USA or, or made in the United States of America, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the crowd would decide. And, and so um, that's kind of what we do. Yeah, there's some plans to do some some different things in the future, but we just have to wait and see what those are. Definitely. I just thought I'd ask. I thought, yeah. you know, perhaps John has something up his sleeve that we don't know. Well, nothing especially up the sleeve, but there's definitely a mad scientist laboratory that's in 24-hour operation. I love that. Yeah, we're going to take a few days off next week because everybody's been running so hard this year. They like to reconnect with some family and friends. Yeah, got to take some time off. Yeah, for a lot of the, the people on our crew, man, they literally are. They're almost 24-7. Just sleep is like they just, they just take it when they absolutely got to have it. They're very, very dedicated, especially some of the guys who have been working on this um, little network of servers. Getting those things to talk to each other sometimes isn't as easy as just uh, typing in a few digits. Definitely. So it's a very, very dedicated crew, and and, um, and so we're just going to chill out for a few days. and then. But we'll do a Christmas Eve show, and we'll do a New Year's Eve show as well. Oh, and very we'll nice. back up and running uh, the week after. Definitely, and we are coming to a close here very shortly here, but I did want to ask you a little bit about music. Um, what are your favorite, um, or what are some of your favorite bands, and uh, do you have perhaps a favorite song in mind that I can use tonight to play you off with? Well, well let me see. Gosh, there's so many. You know, I like, I, you know, I like all music as long as it's good. Uh, I can't even give you the name of this band that, uh, uh, that uh, it's a couple of guys uh, singing. It's kind of an urban sound, but it's, it's called I'm All In, uh, which is a good one. I heard it on Ray, an episode of Ray Donovan, this <laughs> season four, and I thought, Wow, who is that? That sounds excellent. And then this kid goes into this really insane uh, rap using triplets in his speech, and it's it, it's interesting that he that he was able to do that. But uh, you know, of course, I love the the uh, the Eric Clapton's and Mark uh, Knopfler is uh, is one of my favorites. Uh, but just because it's such a got such a thick, friendly uh, tone to his guitar playing, you know who it is instantly when he starts playing. But, but I like Zero Seven. I like the Orb. I like more Chiba. I like Massive Attack. Um, I like Bl- some of the stuff that Blank and Jones does when they you know, do a remix on somebody else's work. And um, uh, so, no, I can't really, I can't really suggest anything. Uh, I like Masters of War, which was written by Bob Dylan but performed by Leslie West on guitar of Mountain and sung with Leslie and also Ozzy Osbourne. That's a that's a killer track. I'm glad you like music, by the way. Oh, I do. Not many people genuinely do. Really? Yeah, I mean, people can name people can name a couple songs here and there, but you can always tell when someone's actually passionate about music or actually cares about what they're telling you. Well, again, there's a lot of people out there making music, and that makes the uh, the margins really low for people who are who are listening. The, The thing is, is that our our tech has really outpaced our ability to use it all. I mean, I get, I must get 10 or 15 books easily uh, a couple of times a week, but I have to take time out to read those books. So it's almost the same thing when you have all these music channels and all this, every kind and style of music you could possibly imagine, symphonic, new jazz, old jazz, jazz fusion, the chill channel, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the spa channel with sort of edgy new age, but interesting, almost soundtrack music for, for some ethereal, uh, adventure that you're going on, uh, to uh, the music out of the forties and, and you, you're able to study. It's like a time capsule. You can study the way people thought and people didn't. You know, they'd go and see a band play because they want to have a good time, a little dance, a little, little, little drinky, you know, some dinner maybe like that. Yeah, a time, little. Boy, weren't they great? Yeah, a little parking lot fun. Yeah, but they didn't weren't listen to it 24 hours a day, you know. That's with right. Phones and yeah. the car and at home and everything else. But uh, this is what happens when when we have just too much of everything. And I really believe in a way, my brother, that that's what we're suffering from, just too much of everything and especially Information. Always remember, there's a difference between intel and info. And the the purpose of intel is to find out the truth. 
not confirm what we already know. And that's what we're struggling with now. And that's why all this, these accusations of fake news and everything else are flying around, because we're absolutely awash in information. And a lot of it is completely useless. I call that sensory perception overload. Well, it is. It, it really is. Mm-hmm. And you uh, you have to take time. This, this idea about uh, find a good martial arts school that teaches traditional Tai Chi Kung Fu. I agree. You'll you'll be in the best shape of your life within six months. You won't even feel it happening. You'll barely break a sweat even at the end of your long form. It takes forty five minutes to do at the slow at the slow pace. And, uh, and, and do that meditation thing. Shut your brain off. Unplug your Wi-Fi. Get, get away from that cell phone. Just get away. Isolate yourself. You remember that movie that, uh, speaking of Tom Cruise a while ago, you remember Collateral? I do. And Jamie Foxx was the cab driver. Remember mm-hmm. that picture of the desert island that he had on his sun visor of his cab? And he said, I take a vacation three or four times a day. Well, he's kind of got a point. There. <laughs> that's true. And that's what you have to do because yeah. if, if you don't, if you try and engage, this entire societal, civilizational experience, you'll wind up walking on the side of your head and you will neither understand much, nor will you enjoy your life. It will, it will begin to affect you and, and maybe even make you mildly to profoundly neurotic. You have to maintain yourself. All the rest of the stuff, the kingdom of heaven is within you. It ain't out here on the street. And I'll leave you with that on this, uh, on Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve. I, I would, I wish everybody would remember that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the Lord's blunt instruments, but I know he's the Lord. I don't mean a Lord or that Lord over there. I mean the Lord and that kingdom, the source of life and your connection to your creator is within you. It's not in that building over there. It, it's, it's within you. Preserve your self. And the only way you can do that is to disconnect from everything else. You just spend a little time with yourself and with the source of your life and you'll be happier for it. And you'll be able to recognize these things that you, that you encounter every day of your life. You'll, you'll be able to, to look at things with a discerning eye, not a serious focus, got that look on your face way, but just you'll understand. You'll, you'll automatically understand and it won't bother you. It won't trouble you because you know what you're doing. You know right from wrong, and you're settled in yourself because you've bothered to pay a little bit of attention to yourself. Putting makeup on your face or putting a great-looking suit on or getting in a great car, that's not you. None of that is you. Yeah. That's a reflection of your taste, <clears throat> but that's not you. And I invite people over this uh, this Christmas weekend to just disconnect from everything except the love of your of life, the love of the source of your life, and the love of those people who are important to you in your life. And if you've got something that, uh, that's, you're cross with somebody, gently put it together. Don't get in a brawl with them about it. Invite them to forgive you. Be willing to forgive you, yourself and them. Remember, love your neighbor as yourself. That doesn't mean you're already eaten up with love for yourself, so give your neighbor a little bit of love too. That means love your neighbor and also love yourself. Don't stand apart from that love. Love is still the most powerful thing in the world. It's the most powerful thing that's ever been in the world. So don't deprive yourself of it. Get into it a little bit. You're not going to find that you go, oh, this this is just not working for me. I just can't stand this. You'll like it. It'll help you. And even if, it, if the results you seek for whatever problem you have aren't instant, it will not harm you, and it will preserve you and give you the strength to go forward so that you can look back at your life and, and go, this was a good run. You can look back on time well spent and any work that you have done it was done as as well as you could do it and you're content and you're ready to go on to the next chapter because i got to tell you something you probably know this but just in case anybody's momentarily forgotten this life when it's over is not the end of the road you're going to go on so remember it and um put some value on yourself i declare 2017 to be to be the year of intolerance We've tolerated everything. We've t- tolerated people who lie, steal, and cheat. But we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to brawl with them or smash them or beat them up. We're just not going to deal with them at all. And their little pathetic initiative will fail 
and they'll have nothing to analyze but themselves. Maybe that'll cause them to have a little introspection. We will either all succeed together or we will all fail together as a civilization. And the first step to saving the civilization, Dr. Pry and I came to the conclusion yesterday, <laughs> if mm. I may be so bold as to put it that way. But we did. We chatted about it for a while. And the thing is, we have to change our minds about the way that we live. We have to have a solid code for living and stick to it. Let our yes be yes and our no be no. And pray. You can call it meditation if you want. I call it prayer. And ask for the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And express gratitude to your creator for being patient with you because you're an a-hole and you can't help it. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. I'm serious. I mean, going Understood. back to Donald Trump, look, you can flower this stuff up as much as you want. But in the end, we're all little nasty human beings and we've got a big problem. We have no idea where we came from and most of us have no idea where we're going or what to do while we're here. For most, for many people out there, they're, they're, the fact that they're alive absolutely terrifies them. That's why they run to these distractions, but you don't have to do that. It is within you. Go inside, open up the door to the, to the, the master disc and groove, man, just to use a, a time old, a time worn expression from the, the age of the dinosaurs, the stone age. Mm-hmm. Just get into that groove and stay there for a, for a while. Cut out these outside distractions. Forget about politics. Forget forget about all your problems, your money problems, your relationship problems, all of it. Just forget about all of it. Cut yourself some slack. Give yourself a break and experience a little peace. It'll be good for you. You'll love it. And Merry Christmas to you. That's very well said. And I we ask. And also, before I let you go, are there any events, conferences, anything you will be attending in a near future here? Uh, some of that stuff is up in the air right now. There are a couple of conferences coming up, but uh, actually we're uh, we're putting together our own conference, but uh, this being the first conference that we've ever done, we want to make sure that it goes absolutely perfectly. And so we want to pull in the um, the very best people who have the best organizational skills to make sure that neither the uh, to make sure that it's an enriching experience and all you, all the audience has to do is just show up and all the, all the speakers and participants have to do is just show up and everything else is taken care of for, for a, a, um, a fluid operation and a great experience. So I'll, uh, I'll put you wise to all that stuff as we get closer to it and, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you know about it far enough out that if you want to let some people know about it or be in attendance yourself, I'd be delighted for you to come. Uh, you'll be able to plan for that and, and make it, and we'll make it as as least expensive as we possibly can and the most convenient uh, of a location for the venue as possible based on the responses that we get from the people who plan to attend. Wonderful. So, yeah, we're going to do this a little bit differently, you know. Yeah, that's, in this case, you know, the mountain may come to Mohammed, so to speak. We'll, uh, just, we'll just have to see. And that's right. And that's caravan to midnight.com for those who are curious about Mr. John B. Wells and his fantastic program. And you could find all the information there. That's John B. Wells. Had a great time talking to you, John. Mutual, sir. Thank you very much for all, for, you know, allowing me all this time to just run on about various subjects. And again, I hope that, uh, that you and your audience found some value in our conversation. I know I did talking to you. So oh, I'd love you. talking to you, John. It's always fascinating, and I always learn something new. Well, I've learned a few things myself tonight. Wonderful. Take care. All right, John. God bless. God bless you. Have a Merry Christmas and a wonderful New Year's. God bless us, everyone. And Good we'll, night. We'll do it again. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You too. And that was John B. Wells, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. What a great guest, right? I'm not that way, I'm a Christian. Oh my. Yeah. Yeah. Not out of bad yeah. school. Not out of bad school. the Illuminati, yeah. We've got to go into it behind them, but the Illuminati certainly is part of the whole thing. The, the top members of the Illuminati are open worshippers. I could tell that all the mainstream media outlets were giving me like bullshit Stay like you can just see it it's clear <laughs> how appropriate I wish I could be in that ring with Holden right now it's crazy I had no idea this shit existed before 726 oh a Grammy I'm not a Grammy I'm a TV real a lot of good content a lot of, a lot of cool topics you know I, yeah, I feel you know fortunate to have an opportunity to speak to you guys tonight you guys are, you guys are really big yeah Mr. Rusev 
that son of a bitch. I, I like that, man. It's the simplest shit. You go in there, you see the bud tender, you say, what the fuck do you have in your pocket? What the fuck are you going to be smoking time about midnight? That's what I want. Just for what it's worth, I want to put in my two cents to tell you both that you have Bro, one of the most here. incredibly well-rounded yeah. shows. Um, other than... Genesis, Introducing the Bill greatest Bernie. tag team on the radio. Guess what, motherfucker? Successfully. Hello,